All right, I think we are up and running. So today is, um, oops, it, <laughs> I'm already starting off with a typo. Today's Friday. This is how busy I've been. Um, I changed the date to March 20th. It is indeed March 20th, and it is a Friday, not Thursday. So my apologies for not changing that. You are here for Yes, You Canvas. And um, this is a little picture of me. I'm Alyssa Sells. I'm a program administrator for the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And I work in the Office of Educational Technology and Open Education. And this is a repeat performance of um, another webinar I did last week. Same exact content. Um, last week we did it as one of our official IGNIS webinars. If you're not familiar with what IGNIS is, it's um, no worries on that. I'm just going to skip all of the Ignis stuff today so that we can um, just get right into Canvas. I'm going to skip all the Ignis intro and everything. Um, the one thing I would like to say to you before we get start started is I'm sure that many of you that are here today are just completely overwhelmed and I want you to tell to, wanted to tell you that that is totally okay. You are not alone and you can do this. I used to not be able to check my email by myself because I didn't understand anything. I was afraid of computers. I'd never used them. I didn't know what I was doing. And now I'm hopefully going to be helpful and instrumental in helping you to learn Canvas. So I just want you to know that you're not alone. And if I can do this, you can do this. Now, granted, I did it over a little bit longer period of time. You're being asked to get up to speed here real quick and, you know, get this going for spring quarter. But I just wanted to offer some words of encouragement to you uh, before we got going today because you can do this. And um, Canvas is, um, it's not hard. It, it's a lot of information to take in at one time, but it's definitely, um, pretty intuitive and you won't break anything. So uh, just go ahead and start clicking around in there. It's totally okay. All right, so um, I do have one question from Mariana or Mariana. Um, are you supposed to see me? Um, no, you won't be seeing me, just my picture that's up on the screen right now because I'm not using my camera today. Um, Ty, maybe you could um, chat privately with Mariana and maybe um, help see what the problem is on that end. Okay. Let's go on to the next slide. Now we know why we're all here. Okay, so I want to do a quick, um, this was intended as the pre-webinar chat. I didn't get the slides up in time. Um, pretty much I'm doing everything fly by the seat of my pants the last couple of weeks trying to get um, this training scheduled and get everything out the door and provide some helpful opportunities for people. So we'll just have this be our webinar chat. And so I would like you to take just one second and um, find the chat for me and um, type in a response to what is the one thing you most want or need to learn about Canvas today? And I think some of you saw the slide before um, I, I got officially going. So if you've already answered the question, that's totally fine. Um, but do throw some questions and things into the chat about what you'd like to learn so I can kind of see where we should focus today. I do have a list of things I want to, to get us through to get you started. And we'll finish up with some question and answer time at the end. I may, we may not get to every single question just because we have a super large group. There are 76 of you here now, and there's one of me, and then we've got Ty helping, and Jen is going to be helping too. So we'll, we'll do our absolute very best to get through as many of the questions and topics as we possibly can. All right, so I'm just going to look in the chat here real quick. I see some tips on speed grader. Um, someone's asking if you can record this. Sure, if you'd like to make your own recording, go ahead. Um, we will be recording this and releasing a link after we have it captioned. So if you don't have space on your computer to record it, no worries. We'll have a link to send out afterward. Um, Okay, someone else is asking about assignments and creating discussions. We will um, get to that, definitely. Um, I'm not sure what capability overview means, but maybe I'm thinking that you just want an overview of the um, some of the basic tools in Canvas. So that's definitely what we're doing today. Uh, another one for submission of online work. 
okay, how uh, students can upload assignments and grade them. Okay, I'm not sure we'll get quite that far. I will be showing you how to build an assignment, but maybe um, you'll want to stick around toward the end in the question and answer time. We could go a little deeper into that one. And let's see how to get your class into Canvas, how to use it, how to access it. Those are definite yeses. We will not get to using Zoom in Canvas today, although there will be a Zoom training next week. It's not going to be focused specifically on using Zoom in Canvas, but we will be offering a Zoom training. I do not have the date or link for that yet, um, so watch for that to go out. I'll tell you where you can find those things in a minute or a little later in the session. Uh, let's see, prepping for your class, making tests, exams. Okay, so it looks like we're gonna get to a lot of the things that you're asking about. Um, chat and conversations we may not get to, um, and we're probably not gonna get to the automatic versus manual uh, posting and hide grades features. We may not be able to have time to dig that deep. So. Um, you may want to stick around at the end and we can investigate that a little bit more. Um, how to make something accessible. Okay, I will show you a few accessibility tips as we go on. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read through all of these because as I said, there's like 78 of you, um, but these are all great things. We'll get to as much stuff as we can. And um, for now, Let's just finish going through the slides and then um, we'll dig into the Canvas topics. And my apologies for not telling you beforehand where to find the chat. We will get to that here in just a second. Okay, so this is the course design resources doc that went into the chat. And Ty, if you could go grab that and put it back in for me, that would be fantastic. This is the short link. It's a bit.ly link. It's course design resources with course design and resources all with um, beginning with capital letters. And it's um, http colon slash slash bit.ly slash course design resources. And we'll talk more about that document later. I just want to make sure everybody uh, grabs the link to that because I've got some extra stuff there that will help you get your courses set up and, and learn some other things, things that we won't be able to get to today. So if you haven't already, feel free to uh, test your audio. You can look at your audio in the um, bottom kind of left corner of your screen. You should have a menu running across the bottom. It's a horizontal zoom menu. If you're not seeing that, it's probably because you're in full screen view. So if you wanna exit out of full screen view, you can um, use the escape key on your keyboard. And um, as you hover over the bottom of your screen, that um, zoom menu should come up and there are some different things on the zoom menu that you can choose from one is to check to test your microphone and um, your speakers you can run a little test on that you can see that in this image um, both the microphone and the video are both muted that's what the red slashes mean also if you are having any um, audio trouble, we do have a call in number and that was also in the invite. So if you need that, um, let me just read it real quick. It's 1-669-900-683. And then when that connects, you'll be asked to enter the meeting ID followed by the pound sign. So that's 403-634-541. And that will get you in. Um, with your phone audio if you're having any trouble with the audio on your um, on your end. Um, someone's asking me to turn up the volume. You can control your own volume on your end in your computer settings. So you should be able to do that individually. Okay, just gonna move on here. We are um, having captions. Today we are um, joined by a transcriptionist who's providing us with live captioned captions. So there is a CC closed captioning button also in that menu bar we were just looking at. Uh, go ahead and click there to uh, access the captions if you would like to read along as we're talking. Okay, here are a couple other Zoom links that might be helpful for folks. Um, if you prefer to navigate using hotkeys and shortcuts, you can do that in Zoom. You do not have to use your mouse. mouse. Um, the link 
find what those are is at http colon slash slash bit.ly slash zoom shortcuts and zoom and shortcuts are both with capital letters and then i've also provided a, a link to the zoom help center here just in case um, you are trying to figure out how to do something in the interface uh, you can go feel free to look that up and that's another bit.ly link and it's uh, slash zoom with a capital z dash and then help with a capital h Okay, moving right along. Let's talk about our participant tools so you know kind of how to interact in Zoom while we're in here talking about Canvas. On that lower menu that we've been talking about that runs horizontally across the bottom of your screen, um, there are some other tools down there for you. If you're not seeing them, you can click the more option and that will pop up another little menu uh, that has some other options on it. The ones I like to have pulled up so I can see are the participants panel and the chat. So if you'd like to do that, please feel free to pop those windows up. And um, there are different views in Zoom, so feel free to click around, find whatever works for you. But if you, if you do want to see who's in here with us, uh, you'll find um, your other uh, fellow participants in the participants panel. And we're going to talk about some of the participants tool tools a little bit more on the next slide. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about chat too. So as I'm speaking today, please put all of your questions into the chat and then we will come back to those as we are able. We like, it's a really easy way um, to get everything documented so that we can come back and make sure we get questions answered. So uh, please feel free to um, type into the chat and have commentary as we're going in that area. All right, here are some additional tools that you have access to in the participants panel. Um, on the uh, left side, there is a blue hand and it's called raise hand. If you click on that and please feel free to go ahead and do that now and give it a try. Uh, if you uh, raise your hand, that will put you in the queue. Thank you, Anne Marie and Karen and Phil, thank you all for raising your hand. That puts you in the queue to be called on and that's how we know that you want to ask a question. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and clear those and then we'll try another tool. Okay, the next one over is the yes checkbox. Uh, sometimes throughout I might ask a question to kind of gauge where we're at and I might ask you for a yes no response. So if you'd practice that right now and either check the uh, green yes or the red X just to practice. Okay, thank you Akiko. I see a couple more, Anne Marie, thank you. Anybody else that wants to, to practice? Danny, good job. Okay, we got some people marking the red X. Thanks, Chris. All right, great job, everybody. Okay, so now you are set up to give me feedback through the participants panel. And then um, if you like to use emoticons, if you go over to um, the far side, there is um, there are three little dots in a gray circle. If you hover over that one, it will pop up thumbs up, thumbs down, hands clapping, coffee, and um, a clock that indicates that you might be stepping away. So um, go ahead and give those a try if you'd like, and feel free to use any of these tools as we are going through the session. Hey Zoe, thanks. I see that you're helping to answer questions. Awesome. And anybody who knows answers to questions as I'm speaking because you already have experience with something we're talking about, please feel sh please, please, please feel free to share in um, the chat area and help answer questions for us. Thanks so much. All right, let's see. I think we're last slide. This is my contact information and I'm just going to um, go ahead and type that into the chat for you. I'm going to give it to you now because sometimes I forget to do it at the end and I want you all to be able to find me if you need to. Okay, so acells at sbctc.edu. That just went into the chat. Okay, and that was the last of the slide piece that I want to show you. So I'm going to actually exit out of PowerPoint and we're going to go into um, Chrome. I'm using the Chrome browser today and we're actually going to enter a Canvas classroom. Okay, let 
me get out of here. And if I wanted to be real fancy, I would have um, used the pause on the screen share so you couldn't see what I was doing. Uh, but I actually do want to come into this document and grab you one other thing before I forget, uh, because this is super, super helpful. I'm going to put into the chat, which I have lost again here. Hold on. Okay, let me open up my chat window again. Okay, here's another link that is... Um, really of interest right now. Copy link. Let's see if I've got the link right in here. I might have pasted it in wrong. Nope, it's in there. Okay, the link I just gave you is to our um, training calendar. I'm just going to pop that up for you uh, real quick here. And this is where you can find if we have training events going on. So um, right now you are in Yes You Canvas. It's a Canvas 101 demo. That's what we're here for. I did lab hours earlier. And then um, starting on Monday, we have a, a, an introduction to Canvas 101 class starting. So um, I just wanted to you know, give you a little bit of information in case you're looking for more training. We did Panopto yesterday. Um, might do some sort of repeat of Panopto, I'm not sure. Um, but we really um, will get to um, um, doing Zoom next week, and this information for Zoom will be posted here. So check back here if you're interested in learning Zoom. Uh, Chris is asking, are those really 12 a.m. or 12 p.m.? Um, I'm guessing that um, maybe the time that was set on that is maybe when the announcement was posted. It's actually an online class that runs for three weeks. So um, my classroom is set to open at 8 a.m. on the 23rd. I didn't actually put the calendar um, invite here, so I can't speak to um, what the 12 a.m. is referring to. Okay, my kitty just joined me. She just jumped up into my lap, so I'm going to hold on to my cat here for just a second. Otherwise, she will sit on my keyboard. Oh, the funny things pets do. Okay, so um, this is an empty shell, and we're going to get to talking about how we populate content in here. Before we get too far into doing that, though, I want to show you the Canvas guides. Okay, my kitty's jumping down. She's using her claws. That kind of hurt. Okay, so the Canvas guides, um, if you take nothing else away from this time together today, please take away the skill of being able to look things up in the guides. So I am going to uh, grab this link. This is the link to the guides. And I'm going to put this into the chat for you for anybody that wants to uh, go and explore this on their own. Maybe even while we're talking is totally fine. So here you will find links to some different sets of guides. One I really, really love is the video guide. And if you go here, there are curated videos that are sectioned out for all users. Some are just for teachers, some are just for students. But this is an excellent resource for you when you just need to watch a quick video or want to show your students how to do something. Come here and see if there's something that's already made because you do want to give your students support resources in your Canvas classroom. Okay, this is um, another one that's really great. I am actually going to pop this one open for us so I can show you what's in here. Okay, so uh, this is what's here. Those are the instructor guides I was talking about. Uh, here's the student guide. Students can come here. This is open to students. They can come here, look through it, find out like how to submit an assignment. But you can also provide the links to the help sheets in this area within your Canvas classroom to make it even easier for your students. And I'll show you how I've done that when we get to looking at um, my Canvas classroom a little bit later. This is the one I'd really love for you to, to look at as you're building, and this is the instructor guide. And they all have these great little uh, table of contents, and you can pick a topic that you want to uh, look at, or sometimes I use Control F, 
and it pops up a little search bar. The last thing I searched for was rubric because I was showing somebody else how to do it. So we can just go ahead and use that same thing. It will tell me how many times the word rubric appears on this page. There's 11. I can use these little arrows to navigate. Here's the rubric section. It's taking me to these rubric things, but I'm thinking rubrics might be mentioned in a couple other places. So let's see what else there is. There's a couple other ones down here. So that can be a quick, easy way to navigate through the guides and find what you are looking for. All right. Let me go back to, um, one page here and show you one other guide. Uh, and that's the mobile guides. And the reason why I'm pointing out the mobile guides too is because we have a lot of students now who are going to be going online unexpectedly and maybe they are used to using the computer lab at home or at at the school, like on the college campus, maybe they go to the library to use a computer and maybe they don't have a computer at home. So you may have a number of students who do need to access your course uh, using mobile. So you will want to be kind of familiar with that. I would encourage you to download the mobile app for teachers. And I would also encourage you to download the mobile app for students so that you can go into the student view in the, in the student app of your course and see what it looks like to your students because what you see in the apps um, is a little bit different depending on what your whether you're a teacher or a student and of course students won't have the teacher app um, but it is good for you as the instructor to to be familiar with both of those views hey Alyssa yeah uh, this is Jen just while you're in the canvas guides sure. um, Rick Downs has a question about how do you copy a colleague's course can you show us how to find answers to questions like that? Or okay. Um, yeah, we, we can look up something. Um, okay, so let me backtrack. I'm going to close these down again. Okay, so this was the main guides page. As the teacher, you want to find the teacher information on this. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Navigated off my screen for a second. Okay, so I'm going to click here on Canvas Guides. That's the main link. I'm going to come here and click on the instructor guide. And um, you're asking about copying a class. So I'm not 100% sure where that might, we might find that in settings because that's where that particular feature is in your Canvas classroom. But to make it easier, I'm gonna use that control F trick that I showed you just a minute ago and I'm gonna search for the word copy Okay, so I have how do I direct share, how do I copy a Canvas course into a new course shell, okay? How do I copy content from another Canvas course using the course import tool? This one's probably closer to what you wanna do. But the answer to the question that's being asked will really depend on where the content is stored. So you're not going to be able to copy the other teacher's class unless they've added you to the classroom and they won't be able to copy into your classroom unless you've added them to your classroom if the faculty that you're sharing with or that is sharing with you has shared their course to canvas commons you can go and download it from there so i can't give you a 100 percent for sure answer to your question because i'm not sure where you're needing to bring the the content in from but you definitely can go into the guides and find um, the the guide sheet for what you you need to do and maybe um toward the end of this we can um in the Q&A piece at the very end, maybe we can come back in uh, to this question and maybe get a few more specifics and learn about importing content. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Jen. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close down some of these extra windows that we don't need. All right, so um, this is what my Canvas classroom looks like, but what I'd actually like to show you first is uh, the dashboard. I'm going to open this in a new tab and the reason why I'm opening things in different tabs right now is so that if we need to flip back and forth between them we can more easily do that because it does take my computer a minute to load. 
Okay, this is a message from one of the other colleges. Okay, so when you log into Canvas, you're going to see something that looks like this. This is your landing page. It's called your dashboard. And we've got these course tiles here. You can see I've got a lot of different courses set up in here. Um, this is my March training. We'll look at that here in a little while. I've got another one labeled uh, Canvas Demo. I'm not sure exactly where it is in my list, but it is in here. The other way you can choose to look for your classroom is on this courses menu here. It's just a little fly out menu. This will put your classes in alphabetical order. And here's that Canvas demo class I was talking about. So we could click there if we wanted. It's, this, it's the same as the dashboard. It's just a, a list instead of the visual tiles. So use whichever you prefer, it doesn't matter. Uh, you will wanna know how to add things to your dashboard and to your list. And you can do that by going here at the very bottom of whatever list you have populated. If you've never taught in Canvas before, you probably don't have anything else here, but you might. Um, so if you click on all courses, it's going to bring up a page that this says all of the courses I've ever been enrolled in or been a teacher of, they're all here. And you'll notice that some have stars and some the star is not colored on. So on the ones where it's grayed out, it means that that's not checked and it is not part of my current list. So anything where you can um, see that the star is a solid color that means that that course is currently displaying on my courses list or my dashboard. So all you have to do is click to remove, click to add, and that will automatically put it into your dashboard view. And that's where we were over here. Okay, so that's what you're gonna see when you log in. And um, before we dive into all the course stuff, um, there are a few account level things I'd like to make you aware of. So I'm going to go ahead and go up here to my account. Um, I'm on the, um, this is the vertical menu on your left of your screen, and it's called the global navigation menu. When we enter a classroom, there's going to be another vertical menu that pops up next to this, and that will be course navigation, and we'll talk about that one when we get there. On global navigation, uh, you have access to your dashboard like we looked at, your courses. You'll also find your calendar link here and also your inbox, and we can look at those. There's a help section, and this one here is Canvas Commons. I'm not sure we'll have time to get there today, but this is an excellent place to go and see if there is um, OER content, so open educational resources that other people have shared so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can go and download information from other people. It could save you a lot of time. There are whole classes in there. There are assignments in there. Um, it's a really great repository of courses. So um, if we have time, remind me, we'll come back and look at that. You won't have this admin. Um, button here because I'm an admin in our instance, you won't have that for yours unless you're working in the e-learning office and you probably would have administrative access. Um, but let's talk about our account features real quick. And I apologize if my voice is getting a little hoarse. I did another hour and a half session this morning and um, my throat's feeling a little uh, scratchy. So I'm just going to have a quick drink of water. All right. Okay, so these are um, your account options. And if you wanted to log out, this is where logging out is. You can choose from notification, profile. There are some files in here. Um, these are not course files, so we're not gonna talk about those right now, but we are gonna talk about settings. And then you do have a few other things in here that we won't get to today, like ePortfolios, um, YellowDig, which I've actually never used. And then um, there is a section for badging as well. I would like us to start with our profile because this is an important piece that can affect how our students interact with us. Not all colleges have the profile feature enabled, but I'm, I think most of them do. And this is where you're going to add a picture of yourself to help your students get to know you. And if you're shy of adding a picture, that's fine, but do add something here. Otherwise, you're just kind of this anonymous icon 
And um, if you're not comfortable putting a picture of yourself here, that's fine. But do put something here that represents you or something that you're passionate about. Um, maybe you like to cook. You could put a picture of a, a maybe you're a chef or a, a pastry chef. Maybe you want to put a picture of a pie here. I don't know. But put something here that will help you um, help your students get to kind of learn who you are. Um, I, I prefer pictures, but I know not everybody's comfortable with that. So you do what works for you. And if you advise students to add a picture to their profile, make sure that that is not an assignment that's graded that has points attached. Because some people, again, are not comfortable with that. You would want to leave that as something optional for your students to do. All right, here on this page, in addition to my picture and my name, um, I've added my personal profile, or my, my personal pronouns, apologies there. Um, and this is an option that a lot of the colleges have enabled in Canvas. It's a new feature. And again, that's just something that's optional in there. I chose to add mine just so uh, they'd be there and it would be um, obvious for everyone. And then um, I've also added uh, a biography here of myself. And this is the part where you can really speak to your students, tell them about your background, anything interesting about you. I've got a lot of work related stuff in here, uh, but I've also got um, you know, some other more personal details in here. And if you remember at the beginning, I said that I used to be afraid of computers. I actually have that in my bio. And I actually do stress that if I can do this, you, you can too. Okay, and then um, on the bottom here, you have options to add some things for Twitter and some links to different things. So these are links for things that I work with and things that, um, like I host the Ignis webinar series and I am the Quality Matters lead for our system. So I've just got links to other training and stuff here that, that will help people get to know me. Um, I see a question. Um, are we supposed to be able to access the course you are demoing? No, not right now. Um, I do have a public version of the course, though, that you will be able to see. Um, it's the public version of Canvas 101. Okay, so that's the profile. You also have some account settings. Uh, that you can um, figure out what works for you. And I'll show you where you can find some more information about these things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I want to get into the building pieces. But as you can see, I've got um, my account information here. These have my different logins at various places. I have different web services that have been added into my account. And again, we're not going to go that detailed today. And then I've got some ways to contact here and some other contact methods. These are places um, where I can choose to receive information. And the reason why I wanted to land here and show this to you is because the next thing we're going to look at is notifications. And um, Canvas will push information to you. You just have to tell Canvas where to send it. By default, Canvas will send it to the email address that your account was set up with. So for most of you, that's going to be your college email address. And you can see my work email is right here, email address acells at sbctc. Edu. And you can see here too that this is the one that I'm choosing to receive information to. The legend for what all of these mean is, is across the top here. So uh, you can see the one I have with the green check in it says notify me right away. So if somebody makes an announcement that gets sent on to me. Now you're probably asking me why do I have all these other things in here and then I'm choosing not to receive information um, by those methods. And the reason for that is because I put a bunch of extra things in here as examples so I could do a screenshot for my students. So this is what other things look like. You can have multiple places you receive information. For me personally, I only like to receive information to my work email. It sends me a little notification that says so-and-so has made a comment or whatever I'm subscribed to for my class and that helps me track it there. But if I also have it sent to my cell phone and I also get a notification to another email address, it just gives it's too overwhelming for me. So um, I actually am only receiving information here. 
The one thing I would recommend for you to do with your students is to um, recommend to them that they come in and look at their notification preferences and if they do not check their student emails through the college regularly, I would suggest having them add an email address here where they do check frequently. So if they have like a home e email address or a personal email address that they would like to receive the push notifications to, or maybe they want them sent to their, their phone. Um, lots of people do that. Uh, if you do have, if they do choose to have them sent to their phone, um, make sure that your students are aware that if they have messaging rates that that will apply because it, Canvas is going to send them a text every time you make an announcement and that could get expensive depending on the student's data plan. So just be a little careful there. But I would recommend having students um, set up a secondary account in here if they're not going to check their campus email regularly. Hey, Alyssa. Um, yes. Hello. You're doing great. Um, Thanks. I know I'm kind of talking really fast. I just have so much to share. No, no, I know you're doing great. I just think um, there's a timely question from Cheyenne asking how she adds pronouns to her profile. Okay. And let me see if I can remember how to do that. I think it was in my profile. And um, your institution has to have it enabled. If your institution doesn't have it enabled, you won't be able to see it. So I came here to my profile and then over here on the far right, there's this little stacked menu under these three little dots and that's where you can edit. And so I'm gonna open the edit and here you can see SBCTC has the pronoun feature enabled and there's a drop down menu. And uh, we have, currently we have she, her, he, him, and they, them. We may be expanding this list. You can, your college can add customized uh, pronouns here. This was just the default setting that Canvas um, debuted the feature, feature with. So we went ahead and enabled, enabled it that way. I'm sorry, I'm having such a hard time pronouncing words today. I don't know what's wrong with me. You're doing great. I am. Ah. And I think, uh, Cheyenne, if you don't have that capacity, then the person to reach out to would be your e-learning director. Is that definitely. right? Definitely. Yep, that is definitely correct. Thank you so much. And this is actually where I added that biography information. So you can write it. Maybe you have it already written. You can just come here and paste it in. And this is also where you can add the different links and things. Now, I didn't make any changes here, so I'm not actually going to resave this. I'm just going to go ahead and cancel. And that will just take us back to the page. But that is where those settings are. And Cheyenne, I just wanted to say really quickly, that's a great question. And I think it's all these kind of little things that make, you know, that make you human and, and set up like a, a space for students to be human with you. Like, I'm not saying this super well, but I think every little bit makes sure that humans, uh, you know, that connection is where I'm going with that. <laughs> yes, I think that is where you're going. Connection, interaction, connection. engagement. Yes, that's all going to be very important because um, many students and many instructors are not used to not seeing each other face to face. And I would just encourage everybody to have an open mind and to try some different things and to be open to change. And whatever you do try, if it's not working, ask your students what's good about it, what's not good about it, whatever it is, get their feedback and then make a timely adjustment. You don't have to wait till the next quarter to change something. Go ahead and, and make a shift mid-class and um, you know that can really help you stay engaged in, in, with your students and get their input and feedback. Okay, I've got another question coming in. How do we know who else other than um, you is talking? Um, well, Jennifer is co-hosting with me. So uh, you'll hear Jennifer Wetham, that's who was just speaking a minute ago. Uh, you'll hear her, Ty doesn't have a mic today, so you won't hear Ty. And then if you do have your participants panel um, pulled up, you can tell whose microphones are on and whose aren't. And most people, uh, I believe, have um, their microphones off right now. So right now you should just be hearing me, but that's kind of an easy way to tell. If cameras were on right now, um, my room is set to have the, um, the camera follow the speaker. So if I had my camera on, every time I started talking, my, my um, camera view would pop up. So that's another way you could tell, but we don't have our cameras on today. 
Okay, um, let's dig into a classroom. Let's make sure. Um, actually, you know what? I think I need to talk about some communication options first because um, we've got a couple more tools that are outside the classroom. So let me, um, before we dig into that, let me, oh, let's see, that was my notification preferences. I guess I had already pulled that up. Okay, this is my Canvas inbox. And again, this is a tab I had pre-opened. I got here by clicking on the inbox icon on the far left on the global navigation. And this is the messaging system in Canvas. And I'm gonna tie this back to the Canvas guides real quick. When you're learning how to do things in Canvas and you're looking things up in the guides, you need to try to use the language that Canvas uses, which might be a little bit difficult at the beginning because you're still learning. But if you go into the Canvas guides and look for email, you're not going to find anything related to email because Canvas doesn't call it email. It's called um, the inbox, it's called Canvas conversations, or you might even find it under messaging. A lot of the help sheets might say something like, how do I message a student in the Canvas inbox could be something that it would be labeled. So if you searched for the word inbox or the ser search for the word um, messaging or Canvas conversations, um, you could um, find it that way, but don't look for email. So there's just a tip on searching. Uh, I see a question about deleting something. Um, let's see. I think maybe it might be here. Right there. Delete. So all I did was open the message from the person and um, I came to the gear icon on the far right. I expanded the menu and the bottom option is delete, which I'm actually not going to do that now because I don't want to um, accidentally delete a message from someone that I haven't read yet. Okay, so here's how you're gonna compose a message. Um, you just click on the icon to write a message, come here to select the course and um, Remember earlier when we were talking about courses that were on our course list or on our dashboard that we had checked the star to favorite them? These are the courses that you have a uh, selection from here. Sorry, my mouse is being ultra sensitive today. Um, go ahead and pick the course that you want to um, message and then that will pop that in there. And then for the rest of it, um, the rest of it is um, just like, regular messaging, just a regular messaging system. Once you have your course selected, you can come here and it, you'll have options to choose everyone in the class. You can pick single students. You can, I think there's an option for um, choosing like teachers in the class. So you can choose from that. You put a subject in. I always check this box to send it as an individual message, even when I'm sending a message to an entire class, just to make sure everybody gets their um, individual copy and they don't get confused and reply all something personal to, um, you know, like a group message. And then the body of your message would go down in this lower part. When you have all those things selected, you're going to go ahead and press send and it will um, send the message for you and it'll end up in the student's inbox. I do see a question about how uh, messaging in Canvas is different than sending an announcement to all students. And um, maybe if, could you remind me to come back to that in just a minute when we um, get to announcements. I'm gonna do the calendar first and then um, we'll come back to announcements because we need to be in um, the actual classroom to uh, talk about those and demo those. Okay, so the other um, thing, the other um, item you can go to on your um, global navigation here is the calendar. And I believe I have my calendar already open, hopefully. Oops, that's Canvas comments. Maybe I didn't open my calendar. Sorry, I have, I was trying to stay organized and open a bunch of stuff. And then I think I opened too many things. So let's just go ahead and open that from here. Okay, I'm gonna open in a new tab just in case we need to come back to the messaging window. And while that's loading, I'm gonna have another drink.
And I do realize that you're getting a ton of information today all at once. And I know how overwhelming it can be. So um, if you're not being able to keep up with everything, it's okay. There, we'll have the video recording. We can come back to that. And then there's also a public version of um, the Canvas training course that you can look at and find um, information about. And we'll get to showing that here pretty quick. Okay, so this is my calendar in Canvas, and this is what um, the calendar for my March class looks like. I've only got a couple things on here for them right now. And you can tell which calendar is displaying by going through, um, scrolling through this menu here on your right. And anything that has a colored box by it is something that's displaying. Now we haven't added any dates to the Canvas 101 demo course yet, so we don't see anything there. And then from my March class, we are seeing the March dates in red. Each class will have its own color. You can't control the color. It will, Canvas will assign the color on its own, and the color you see will be different than the color your students see. So don't tell them go look for the dates in red on their calendar because it might be a completely different classroom. Um, but they can come and check and overlay. They can see all of their classes together. They could click, like say they're taking a full-time load. They've got three five credit classes. If they checked all three boxes for those, they would have an excellent time management tool because they would be able to see all of their due dates from all three classes all in one place. So I would encourage you to use the calendar tool. Um, these are just calendar events that are on here right now. These are just non graded reminders and um, we are going to uh, come back to this when we're talking about assignments and we'll come back and look at the calendar after we've added a graded assignment because if you add a due date to a graded assignment it will put it not in not just in assignments but it will automatically add it here to the calendar for you and students love 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 consistent due dates that's probably one of the biggest complaints i hear from students is um, that they there are misleading and inconsistent due dates throughout the course and i'll i'll show you how this works integrated with the um, syllabus tool here in a minute as well so to add um, a new event there's a plus button up here and it will just ask you, sorry, I don't know why my computer's running so, so slow here. Um, you can tell which classroom it's going to be added to because of the color. I can already say, oh, I didn't mean to add this to my demo class. I wanted to add it to my March class, and then it will change it to red. So make sure when you're posting dates that all of the dates you post for a single class are all one color. Then you just go ahead and fill this information in here, and you can click Submit. If you wanted to create an assignment from here, you could create the assignment shell by putting it here. It'll ask you for the title. Again, you have to select the class it's going to go to. Maybe we wanted that in our Canvas demo class, so we could add that here. And actually, why don't we just go ahead, I'll just go ahead and save one, and then we'll have, there will be one assignment populated when we get over to um, our other area when we go look. Let's see. Um, I'm not going to call this assignment one, though. I'm just going to call it example for now. And I'll explain in a minute why I didn't choose assignment one. OK. Um, if you wanted to publish it from your calendar, you could publish. That means students can see it. Or you can un keep it unpublished. I'm going to leave this one unpublished because we haven't added any content to it yet. And if we go ahead and submit this, uh, you can see that it added it right here. You can see the icon is different. If it's an ungraded calendar event, it's just this little calendar icon. If it's a graded assignment example, it has, looks like kind of like a piece of paper and a pencil. Okay, let us go tackle um, announcements now because that is actually what is on my list next. Let's see. Okay, this is our, oops, where did it go? Did I accidentally close it? I think I might have accidentally closed it. Okay, let me just grab it off my courses list again. Okay, Canvas demo, there it is. 
All right, so this is what you probably received from your e-learning office was a course shell. It's probably completely empty. This is what it looks like when there is absolutely no content in it. Have no fear though, we are gonna start adding content, but we are gonna go here to the announcements tool real quick. And this is another way to communicate with students. Pretty much anything in Canvas that you can add has a plus button by it. So just look for the plus button. This one says add announcement. That's what that means. So if I want to add an announcement, just going to come in here. I'll come up with um, a title. I'll just call this one an example for now. And one thing I forgot to tell you about me is that I am a terrible typist. So I have it and it gets worse the more people are watching. Uh, and I can't spell today either announcement. Did I spell that right? Okay. Um, then we would have you put in your um, copy here. I'm not going to take the time to actually add words here, but whatever you would want to tell your students. Okay. Um, if you have multiple sections, sometimes you have different options of um, places to post to. So make sure if you're you are teaching multiple sections and they're available in here out of the same classroom um, that you choose all sections. If I wanted to attach a file, I could do that. I um, use this one quite frequently, this option delay posting. And what this does, it allows you to select a date in the future. Um, let's say I don't want this to post today, I want it to post next Friday. So I can select the day, date, and time. You don't have to put the time in there, um, but you can. Um, so if you just choose that date and say done, um, then Canvas knows not to post this until next Friday. And then um, I don't use allow liking or enable podcast feed. Um, and I also have this one disabled allow users to comment. And I do tell my students this, I frequently forget to come and check for questions in the announcements area. I actually, it is my preference, it's a personal preference of mine to drive all student questions to a single place so that I can help stay organized. So I ask them to post their questions to um, and ask a question module that I have set up that stays in my class for the whole session when I'm teaching and any any course related question can be asked there at any time so I don't um, I don't check that one and then all you do is save it and then um, this is what it looks like but if you want to see like a, a better real life um, version of this, let's go find my March class and we'll click on announcements here and you can see the announcements I've made to students. And this is where adding that profile picture is important because they know students can easily tell that I'm the one that posted all these. And here's a workflow tip for you. I have gone in ahead of time and posted my, the majority of my announcements that are announcements that I make every single session. I go in and pre-post those and use that delayed posting setting so that I don't have to remember to come back and post something on a specific date. As long as I have my date set correctly for when I want it posted, Canvas will do that work for me. And it has saved me so many times. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten too busy and gone, oh my gosh, I forgot to tell my students, you know, whatever it was. And I'm like, oh yeah, I have that set to automatically post. So um, this is a great workflow tool for you. Hey, Alyssa, this is Jen. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of different questions in the chat that I think are kind of asking the same question, which is kind of the purpose of posting an announcement versus the purpose of sending your students a message in Canvas. Do you see them having different purposes? Like, are there different, like, why should somebody, should they post to announcements versus sending a message? Is there ever a time when you would do both? Does that um, make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I was just going to get there. So thank you oh, for the, great, thank great. you for the prompt for the reminder to do that. Um, I see another question about it. What, which one's more efficient. Um, announcements can be efficient, but if students don't have their um, notifications set to notify them that you've made an announcement and they don't actively come in and click on announcements, 
they're going to miss a lot of stuff. So going back to the conversation about student notifications, make sure they're getting their push notifications from Canvas to whatever communication channel they prefer, whether it's their you know, text messaging on their phone or an alternate email account, somewhere where they're going to see that, um, you know, that there's been an announcement posted. And they will only receive the notification for your announcement if they have checked that they want to be notified right away or at all that that is happening. So, um, you know, it, it just depends on how you need to reach people and what, um, you know what you're trying to do. I use both and I will tell you how I use them. I have a certain number of um, messages I post routinely that I know that students need at specific times. So I give a welcome to Canvas message. So this for you could be a welcome to class message and that gets posted um, before the class starts. And then I have these other announcements set to send students the information in announcements based on things they're going to probably be started on in my class. Like one thing that they're asked um, to do is to introduce themselves. Part of it, the introduce yourself and part of learning about your communication channels and adding your bio and whatnot, those assignments, um, I talk about adding your profile or your avatar. This isn't an assignment, it's just a suggestion and then they can choose whether to put their image in there or not. I also give them um, a prompt to, and this is, you know, at the very beginning of class, just after we're a couple days in, you know, please post your questions here. Here's just a quick reminder. Um, so I use my announcements more for prompts and things that I want um, students to keep up on as we're going. And then in my inbox is where I typically choose to send um, information where I might be asking for a personal reply from the student and an example of that and would be the um, like check-in messages I send. I send um, three check-in messages in my three-week class. One is a week one check-in, a week two check-in, and a week three check-in. It asks everybody to check in with me, let me know what kind of problems they're having, uh, let me know how I can help them, and I get a lot of people that, you know, they'll just reply and say, hey, you know, it's going a little slow, but I'm going to get caught up this weekend. So it's a place for students to interact with me that's not public to everybody in the class. So um, I guess it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish with the type of communication. What I wouldn't do probably is put the same announcement in announcements and then also send it out through messaging. You just need to pick and choose um, which method works best for um, the type of information you're trying to communicate. And when I'm trying to be um, interact more one-on-one -on -one with students, that's the kind of information I tend to put in my um, messaging area like the inbox versus announcements. And then I do have my public question area um, in my classroom too, which um, I think I saw somebody ask a question about that. So while we're here, let me just show you um, my ask a question area. We're getting um, a little bit out of order. I mean, so far we've gotten to all the things, but I, w I really do want to dig into the building of things here. Um, but on my homepage, I have an icon students can click. They could also find it by going to discussions. It's a discussion that lives all session and um, it's just an ask and answer. Give some directions, give some help links for what, um, you know, if they need a little help or like, how do I post to a discussion? I don't know how to do this. So those help sheets are here. These all came from the Canvas guides. So you don't need to create any of this stuff. This how-to stuff's already built for you. We already looked at that. Uh, here's a question from a student and then I answered and then the student said, great, thank you. So um, this is just a running list of questions where students can come and see 
what I have answered already. And this helps me not to have to answer the same question over and over because if I know I've already answered it, I can just say, hey, go back up and read the post I made to whatever that student's name was. And then if that's not enough information for you, let me know. And then I, I can follow up with that student some more. So that's kind of the difference between um, my communication methods um, in my class. Jen, does that get to what um, yeah. type of questions that were being asked? Are there any, is there anything else related to that? Um, I, th I think so. I guess the only thing I would say is, um, yeah, I, th I, I definitely think you did. I was just going to add that one of the things that you want to be thinking about when you set up your course is training your students how to respond to you. And so I yeah. just say I love the idea of having a question module so that because if one person is asking it probably a lot of people are asking it so it can be a big time saver and and so if students email you questions you could respond to them privately but another way is to just say hey can you post that to the q a discussion board so i just wanted to kind of add that as a yeah. little time saving tip yeah, and the other time saving tip I would say for the ask a question area too is that um, occasionally I'm away from my desk and out of the office and I actually encourage students to answer questions for other students. So I might say, hey, I'm going to be at a conference for the next two days. I am going to be checking in on the class, but the times I check in are going to be random. And, you know, in my absence, please help each other out. If you know the answer to a classmate's question, please go ahead and post it. And it's so awesome when um, you get students in here answering questions for each other and helping each other out. And then I usually just thank that person. And then if I have anything in addition to add, I'll say, oh yeah, and don't forget about this part. And if I need to add any more information, I'll, I'll do that. So um, I see a question specifically from Holly about um, using the ask a question versus having students email their questions. For me, it is a workflow. So efficiency and effectiveness. Um, you know, because I don't have to answer the same question over and over. And then I also think that it helps build community. And, um, you know, once one person is brave enough to, to ask a question, then lots of people start asking questions. So I think it's, it's a great way to take some of the fear out of question asking. All right, I want to dig into some other things. So I'm going to go on from this because we're already an hour in and I still have so many things that I want to um, talk about. Although I did start a little out of order and I showed you the guides first, so I just crossed something else off my list. Okay, we are going to go to, um, I think, to the syllabus next. So let's look at a syllabus. Okay, so this is the syllabus that's in my class. Um, you won't have anything as fancy to start with. I'm going to show you this for context. I'm going to take you back to the demo class and show you actually how to use the editor to um, add your information in. What I do want to point out here is that I've used a combination of two methods for the syllabus. I have my syllabus built into the syllabus page in Canvas. There's a content editor in here where you can add information in. And then I also have have a printable version and I've done this for um, accessibility. Um, this both pieces are fully accessible. Both of them are um, screen reader friendly um, but some people like to have a document to download. Some don't so I'm trying to cover as many bases as I possibly can. So I've got all that here and all the information from my class is in here. I've built it in. Yours, again, is not going to be as fancy at the beginning. Um, for now, we're just going to concentrate, I think, on just getting a document uploaded to the page. And so let me show you how to link your syllabus to um, your page. But you can see this is quite lengthy. And what's here, though, mimics what is in um, the printable version here. So let's find our demo classroom. I think this is the demo classroom because we haven't built anything here yet. Okay, so here's our demo classroom. Um, hey, Jen, when I am done with um, the syllabus, could you prompt me to come back to the course navigation so I don't forget, please? Absolutely. Because I think I meant to show that first, but we're already in conversation for the syllabus, so I'm just going to go ahead and go there. Okay, so this is an empty classroom 
And um, this is the default order that everything comes in. We'll come and talk about navigation in a minute. For now, I'm just going to click on the syllabus page. And this is what the syllabus page looks like before you add any content. So there are three main areas to this um, page. You've got this upper area here where you can add your content or link documents. You've got a lower area here that is, um, I, I think it's called the syllabus table, and it will generate um, by due date a list of assignments in your course for students. And do you remember how we added that example assignment from the calendar? It's right here. Remember how I said it was gonna connect and everything was gonna be consistent? So we added it on the calendar for Friday the 20th. It's added it here to the course syllabus for Friday the 20th. And when we go look at an assignment, there's going to be an assignment shell that has Friday the 20th on it also. So um, this was pre-populated here. Normally this is empty if you haven't added anything here, but because we were working in the calendar earlier, um, it, it went ahead and went onto the syllabus table because um, we ch I chose to save it when we were there. I'm just going to turn off someone's video real quick. There we go. All right. Um, and then the other area is um, there's a, a, a smaller version of the calendar here in the sidebar. And then here, if I had my assignment weights set up, um, and I have those set up in my other class, we can look at it um, later. Um, but that information would be here if you had assigned um, weights to your assignment groups. So um, for now, let's just open the editor and um, you might give some introductory, sorry I can't talk and spell at the same time and I still can't spell, okay introductory info like what the student's supposed to do, please read, whatever that would be, okay? And then um, to add your actual syllabus to this page, I am going to go um, to files, and I haven't uploaded anything yet, um, so I'm gonna go to files, and it's gonna let me choose from my course files, or it's gonna let me upload something new. And I did not pre-populate or pre-add this to um, the course files because I wanted you to see an empty course. So I don't actually have anything to choose from from course files. So I'm gonna choose to upload a new file. Okay, I have to browse my computer, so I'm gonna choose file. I'm gonna come in here and I am going to find my Canva, Canvas, yes you Canvas demo folder and there's a syllabus we can use. I'm going to select that, click open, and I'm on a PC so if you're using a Mac it'll look a little different for you but it'll be similar. Okay, so I've said um, that I want to upload this and then um, if you have some folders, if you've gone into files over here already and created yourself some folders, those will populate on this menu here and that is an excellent way to keep yourself organized. And I'm going to click upload and then you're going to see that the file is going to upload to my page where my cursor was parked. Okay, so this is just like super basic. Um, then we could update, that saves it. Okay, and then, um, oops, what happened to it? Did I click the wrong thing? Oh, now I have to start over, all right. Um, but this is a good opportunity to show you that um, that document is in my course files, so I don't have to upload it new again. Okay. And I don't know why it didn't save. I swear I clicked the update button. There it is. Okay. So there's my, my file. That doesn't look very pretty, and it really doesn't tell students what they're supposed to do with it. So I'm going to open the editor again. And... Um, one thing you can do before you upload a document is you could actually assign it text, like you could write download the syllabus, okay? Then you can highlight this text and you can come over to files. And if we wanted to upload it new, we could do it from there. I'm gonna choose the one I already have because I don't wanna get multiples of the same thing in here, okay? And now that document is linked to 
the same thing. One is just the file extension, the full file name, which doesn't look very nice. This one actually tells students a little bit more information. Download the syllabus. You can make it say whatever you want. And again, you do want to include some introductory text. I'm not going to take the time to type anything, but whatever instruction or additional information you want to give students, um, you can give them there. Let me update and save this again so you can see the changes that we've made. Okay, and then um, I want to do one more step here and I'm going to set this as a file preview. So once you have your link built, I'm going to park my cursor in here and I'm going to click this link button and it's going to ask me if I want to open an auto um, inline preview for this link and I really do want to do that. Okay, so I'm going to set that and I'm going to save this. It might take a minute to generate. Last time I did it, it was really, really fast. It looks like it's going to be maybe pretty fast today. Let's see. Okay, so um, what this did for me, now you can see the visual of my syllabus. This is one thing that could be an efficient option for you right now because you may not have time to build your syllabus in the way that I have mine built in and provide a linkable document. So a shortcut to that is to set the file preview so that students don't have to download. They could just scroll through here and, and, and look at it this way. But then for anybody who wants a printable version or wants to, um, needs to use a screen reader with it or other assistive technology, um, they have the, the option to actually download and use it here. So that's just quick on um, the syllabus. Let me go here real quick. Remember I said that the assignment group weights were here. Um, those show um, on the right side. You don't see those until you assign them and hopefully we'll, we'll see if we get that far. Um, I've got a lot of great stuff in my syllabus, but I don't want to focus on the content too much. Uh, what I wanted to show you was, was what was pre-populated into my assignments area. My three dated items are here at the top in date order. The rest of the items in my class, I've used an alphanumeric coding on them, module 00-B00-C, to keep them in order because in my classroom, I don't have assigned due dates. I let my students work at their own pace and the content with module um, requirements is set to open as they finish other tasks. So um, I don't have due dates on all of mine, but students really appreciate due dates. So please make sure that you're adding due dates to your assignments and I'll show you how to do that as soon as we get into um, creating an assignment. All right, Jen, are there any um, syllabus related questions we should hit on real quick before I talk about the um, navigational pieces? I do not see any syllabus related questions. People I think are still following the um, question in the uh, okay. modules, yeah. Okay, okay, we can come back to that if we need to. Um, but let's talk about course navigation real quick. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to my home page. Okay, this is what this home page looks like. We'll, we'll get to home pages here in a second. Let's go find our empty home page. Okay, so um, we haven't added anything to this course. The default for the home page is modules. And then these are the default navigational items. I'll show you how to change the home page in just a second, but we're going to first talk about the course navigation menu. Remember I said we had on the far left, we had global navigation. Okay, this other little menu that pops up is the course navigation. Anything that has a little I with a slash in it means that it's not viewable to students. And there are several areas and modules is one of them that stay grayed out or inaccessible to students until the teacher adds content to them. Okay, so let's scroll down to our course settings. And this is where you're gonna be able to make changes to this navigational menu for your class. And the advice I'm gonna give you is to remove anything from your course navigation that you don't need students to use because it's easier for them if they don't have to look through a bunch of options. And you should also put it in the order that makes the most sense for your class. Okay, so I clicked on my course settings and now I'm going to click on the navigation tab 
And currently in this class, these are all the things that a student could see. If we don't want students to see something, we're going to drag it down here to the bottom. And I'm just going to drag a bunch of these uh, so that um, we can really easily see the change in um, what the student would see. Okay, now what's left up here are things that I commonly use. Not that I don't use some of the things I drug down below, but what I want to show you here is the reordering. I'm just going to drag and drop to where I want them. I think if you click here, you can also use um, the move up and down button. I prefer drag and drop. You can use whichever method works best for you. Okay, so um, I like students to hit my home page. I like the syllabus to be front and center. Then I like to usually drive them to announcements. The next thing for me that I think is next most important is modules. So I'm going to put my modules in there. And then I think I usually have um, some order like this. I can't remember exactly how I have them. Um, the people area is where your class roster is. If you're using groups, you need to leave this enabled in your classroom. Pages is an alphabetical list of all the pages in your class. It's a good index for students. They could go there and um, do control F and do um, like a quick search like I showed you how to do in the um, Canvas guides. Like maybe they remembered reading something on a specific topic, but they can't remember which module it's in. That gives them an extra place to go and look. But if you don't want them using that, all you have to do is drag it down here. Um, you may want to remove file access from your students as well. Okay, let's see. I'm just going to take a few more things um, just so our list is nice and short. Um, students probably want grades at the top, but I don't want them so concentrated on grades, so I'm going to leave it at the bottom for now. Okay, I'm going to save this. And as the teacher, you're not going to see um, a lot of change. You can see that this list looks like it shortened a little bit, but let me pop over here using um, the sidebar menu on the far right. I'm going to go into student view and I'm going to show you what um, the students would see. And you know that you're in student view when you have this pink, hot pink line around it or magenta line. And um, this is where you can go to check and see what things look like after you've built them. You can come here and use your test student to run through the course and see, you know, what is the student actually seeing? Because as the teacher, you might be able to see something. An example would be you have something like a page that you think is published. You can see it because you're the teacher. And if you don't realize that that page hasn't been published to the student, when you get to student view, that page isn't going to be available. So it's kind of a check and balance on your own work. And here you can see we have home, syllabus, announcements, discussions, assignments, and grades. And you can see that we're missing modules. And the reason why we're missing modules is because it's one of those sneaky navigation items that stays grayed out until a teacher adds content to it. So we won't be able to see modules on the student navigation menu until we go build one. And we are going to do that here in just a minute after we look at the home page. Okay, does anybody have questions on um, why you would want to um, change the student navigation around or options for different things in this area? I'm just going to go ahead and leave student view. Listen, I'm not seeing anything. Not seeing anything? Okay. All right. Um, I will tell you, um, lots of teachers take like discussions and assignments and quizzes. They'll take those away from students because they want to force them through the content. Um, you'll have to make the choice for yourself. My personal preference is to leave those things open to students because it is a good way to go and find things. And if you're using um, due dates and like if you have an access date where students can't access something, access something until a certain time, it doesn't matter if they can see that it's upcoming. They're not going to be able to get into it because you put the date on it. They couldn't get to it until a certain time. So um, there are benefits to doing it both ways. Again, choose what works for you. What works for me is to give my students as much flexibility as possible. And Alyssa, can I just say really quickly that um, I, I love what you just said. This is Jen talking again. And one thing that I think 
I would, the one thing that I will say is when I first started teaching online back in like 2001, I thought that it was, I thought that I had to have all of these things. And so what I did was I, and I'm just saying this for all of you who might be new to online learning. And I thought that because there was a place for a syllabus, because there was a place for modules, discussions, I thought I had to populate everything. And again, that was with a different learning management system, but I do think sometimes keeping it simple is mm -hmm. better. Um, so yeah. I just wanted to say for folks, just when in doubt, like I, I've been hearing a lot of people talk about like lifeboat strategies. So when in doubt, you know, just keep it simple. Does that make sense? Yeah, do keep it simple. Um, keep it simple. And I, the other thing that I said earlier was stay flexible and have an open mind. You're sure. still learning this. Ask your students how it's working on their end and don't be afraid to make a change. Just, Good you know, point. make a change if you need to. If something you're not doing isn't working, go ahead and change it. Just tell your students that you're changing it, why you're changing it. And, um, you know, that could be a good thing to put in a course announcement. Hey, from your feedback, I see that, you know, whichever piece of this isn't working, having this on. So I've changed the settings and you should now be able to access it in this way. Just tell them what you're doing. Keep in that constant communication with, um, with your class and they'll appreciate that. Okay. That. Who wants to build a, um, oh, I was going to say who wants to build a module, but I think maybe we should look at the homepage first. And Alyssa, just really quickly, there are two questions, and I guess we should, but they're not about, they're not quite related to what we're covering. Okay. We so save them. Okay. Yeah, let's not, I don't, I don't even know if I can answer the Office 360 question. Um, uh, let's see. Wondering if you integrate into live sessions. Okay, um, so maybe live sessions is meaning um, synchronous versus asynchronous. So let's hold both of those to the end because those are not both Canvas specific. Got it. Okay, um, coming back here, uh, since we're parked on the homepage, let's go ahead and talk about homepages real quick. Um, again, reminder, this is what mine looks like right now. Yours is not going to look like this until you get Mine in here. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I just, I choose to have a visual homepage because I am a visual person and um, I get overwhelmed by a lot of text. And so I like to see pictures. So I tend to teach and give options toward um, things that are that are visual, which is why I choose um, this homepage layout. It's called a pages front page layout. Um, so let's go back to our demo class and let me show you where these options are. Because right now you've got a blank screen and it's defaulted to modules, although you don't know that it's showing modules right now because we haven't built a module yet. But if we went over here to modules and built one, um, you would be seeing it on your home screen. So go over to the right hand side over here in the sidebar menu and we're going to click on choose home page. And these are the options that you have. You have syllabus and if you click on syllabus, and we clicked on save, anything we had built on our syllabus page, it connects those and it will force students to view the syllabus on the home page. Now that could be great for the first like couple days of class or you know, the first week of class, but maybe after that you would want to change it. Again, let students know you're changing it. You need to do what works best for you and what works best for your students. You can also change it to assignment list. My personal preference is not assignment list because it makes students focus on assignments rather than learning the content. And um, while I think it is good for students to stay informed of the assignments that they have, they have a lot of other places to access that information. So I don't think that it's necessarily the most friendly thing for them to see. A uh, course activity stream can be interesting because it does um, give you a view of like course announcements and some other things, but you need to kind of give your students some context for what you're using and why you've chosen what you've chosen. If you remember the radio button for course modules was the one that was clicked when we got here. And you'll notice that pages front page is grayed out and the reason for that is that you have to um, go into pages build a page and then tell canvas that that's the page that you want to use and as soon as you do that that will populate here as an option 
And rather than going through that whole building a page piece, I'm going to take you back to my other classroom where my page is already built. And I'm going to show you what it looks like when, when that option is selected. So I have pages front page here. You can see um, my page name. And if I wanted to change it, I have that option here. Okay, I'm going to cancel out of here. I'm going to go to pages. Okay, and this is where we can build a page. We can also add a page directly to a module. I'm going to click on view all pages. It will give me a list of all the pages alphabetically in my class. And you can see everything in here is published except for one. Um, I had an HTML practice page in there that I was using. That one didn't have the little green check mark on it because I didn't have it published. Here is, let me make this just a little bit bigger for you. See if you can see this a little bit better. Okay, you can see here that I've built a page called Homepage Final because that was my final version of it. I probably should make it something more meaningful to students. Um, but I have selected that as my homepage. And to do that, I come over here and um, there will be an option here. This option is to remove as front page because I already have it selected. If I hadn't selected it yet, it would have an option to make it that. And let's see, I'm not sure what happens with the options. Okay, use as front page. So it looks like you can, um, you do have the option to choose a different home page before you've deselected something else. But you do have to have a page built in order to be able to um, use that pages front page option. All right, I will show you how to build a page in just a minute. Let's go back to our demo class. I'm going to leave this. Um, I'm going to leave this uh, defaulted to uh, the modules page so that we can come back and look at it um, when we have a module built. Okay. All right. Let's see. Are there any relevant comments to this? Uh, looks like somebody's asking about grades. The grades option. We'll get to that at the end. Um, a couple comments from you, Jen. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything. Okay. To okay. All right. Now I'm going to ask you to use your um, buttons in your participant panel. I'm going to ask you who wants to build a module. And if you want me to build a module and show you how to do that, let's check the yes button. I realize I've been um, talking for a long time and haven't actually asked for participation other than questions in the chat. So let's just pause here to have you interact um, a little bit. So I'm seeing lots of yes checks. Okay. We've still got about 70 people in here. Lots of people are checking that yes button for me. A couple of you have said no. I'm assuming that maybe you already know how to do that. Okay, all right, we're gonna go ahead and build a module now then. Thank you so much. I'm gonna clear those responses. There we go. Okay, let's go ahead and build a module. I'm going to go to modules or you could use that link there, create a new module. Um, Either way is fine. I just chose to use the navigation to get here. And then like anything in Canvas, to add something, you're going to click the plus module button to add a module. Okay. Let us um, call this, oh, I did a demo of this last week. So it's remembering that I had a few other modules in here. So let's add our getting started module. We'll add that as a title. Let's go ahead and add, um, Let's add module one, okay. And then the other one I might add, let's go ahead and add ask, whoops, see, poor typing again. Ask a question, okay. If I wanted to lock the module, I could um, pick a date here to lock it. If I wanted to add a prerequisite for when it was completed, I could do that here. Although I don't have a lot of options right now because I don't really have much content built. So I'm not going to choose any of those right now, but if you do want to sequence your class, um, you would use these features in here to do that. Right now, we're just going to simply add content. Okay, um, let's see. 
Okay, I've got some stuff that's in here. It's kind of out of order. Um, typically, you can drag and drop these, but I'm not seeing that that's working right now. So I'm going to go ahead and go over here. I'm going to say I want to move this module and I want to move it to the top. So that's the option I'm going to leave. But you can say before, after, or bottom. But I'm going to say at the top because I want my ask a question to be here at the top. What would we put in our ask a question module? Well, what I have in mind is a discussion. So let's do that again because I wasn't talking about what I was doing. Okay, so here's the module we built. All it is right now is the name. Um, also, what is a module? It is basically a content unit. It is just a convenient place to organize and house and structure um, a learning lesson for a student. So it's like a learning unit. You could kind of think of it maybe like as your lesson plan. It's what you would do in that class period or what you would do for that topic or for that week. And you can give more descriptive names than module one. And I'll show you my module titles in um, my class here in just a second. We can go back in and look at my modules. So to add something to my module, I'm going to click the plus button. I said I wanted to add a discussion, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to select discussion. It's a new topic because I haven't built a discussion in here. So if I had built a discussion somewhere else, if I'd gone into discussions and built a discussion, um, those titles would pre-populate here for uh, me to choose from. So I'm going to choose new topic. And then it's asking me what it's called. Um, this is going to be an ask. Oops, sorry, I've got my caps lock on. Ask a question. Okay, so here's my ask a question discussion. Um, I'm not going to indent this one. I'm just going to leave it flush with the side. So I'm not going to choose anything from this menu here. You can choose le levels of indentation. And then I'm going to say add item. And now we have a discussion in here. I'm going to pop this open to show you um, that means that we have a discussion there. We have a discussion shell. We don't have any content here. So we still need to do some work on this. So I'm going to open the editor on this discussion shell. And if this is the ask a question discussion, I would put content in here related to you know, asking a question. Let's go look at what mine um, says. And I'm showing, I'm, ch I'm purposely choosing different ways to navigate so you can see different ways to get to the same places because it's kind of all linked together. So here's my ask a question discussion. I have a header in here that says ask it here. And then I have the directions for what students would do here, what they can use this area for. I say this is just like raising your hand in class to ask a question in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom because it really is. It's just not synchronous. They're just asking it on their own time and they're getting a reply back from me when I'm able to get in and reply. And then I say, you ask, we answer, and everyone benefits. And again, that's back to that same discussion we had earlier where as a teacher workflow, I'm answering a lot of common questions all in the same place and I don't have to keep repeating myself and answering the same thing over and over. So, um, this ask a question discussion works really, really well for me. And then I also give the help links at the bottom. So you can choose what you would put in here for your students. Um, what we were building was um, an ask a question. So we would give the directions here for what we want students to do. My ask a question is a threaded discussion, meaning that it keeps the responses um, threaded or attached to or hierarchically um, organized beneath whatever the original question was. And that's a really great way to be able to see, especially when you have a large class with a lot of comments. If you have three or four people come in and comment on the same thing, um, this threaded piece will keep those organized for you. Um, I rarely use users must post before seeing replies and I do that again to be inclusive and flexible. Some people are very hesitant about 
getting started in a discussion. They don't know what to post. They're unsure about what they're supposed to do. So for some students, it does give a little bit of comfort to see that they're not the first one and to kind of see what their classmates are doing. I know a lot of teachers use this to lock students out of seeing other people's um, postings because they want everybody to write their own thing. Um, you know, you're going to have to choose what's right for you, but what's right for me is making sure that my students feel comfortable. And I do that by giving the most amount of flexibility that I can for any of the things that I'm doing in my classroom. Um, enable podcast feeds. Somebody asked me about that last time and I actually have never used that. I don't know what it does. That's something we would need to go look up in the guides. So if somebody wants to take a little side trip right now and go back to the guides and type in enable podcast feed or discussion settings maybe even and see if you can find the answer to that. That could be a little uh, interactive challenge we could have going right now. You could teach me something. If this was a graded discussion, I would click graded. And then once you click graded, you get all of these other options. I'm not going to make this particular one graded because this is not something I grade. I want people to ask questions, so I'm going to leave that ungraded. I also don't use allow liking. Um, I don't think there's any reason to use it necessarily or not to use it. If you have an intentional purpose for allowing liking, if you're doing something special with voting up a post, like who's the best post in the class or something, there's a tool in here to do that. It's just not one I choose to do. Um, and then add to student to-do list. There is another area um, for students where you can force something to their to-do list and um, you could go ahead and, and um, put that in here and add a date if you want it to go there at a certain time. I don't have a lot of experience with that, um, so I can't speak super in depth on that. Um, let's go down to, um, we're not gonna talk about group discussions. That's gonna take us way in further than we um, wanna go today. If you wanted to set um, when this is available from, this is where you can say, okay, this is discussions in here, but I don't want you to access the content until the 25th, and I want you to be able to access it until, um, I don't know, like the next Friday, okay, maybe it's due on Friday. You'd probably put a due date uh, time in there as well, um, but you can choose what those access points are. Now, this is a discussion that I leave open all the time, so I actually don't want to have any of these dates on here because I want this open and it's not graded. Okay, and now I'm going to save and publish because I'm say I'm ready to have this viewable for students. This is what it looks like. Um, anybody that comes in here can post their reply. It opens up the rich content editor. I'm not typing anything that makes any sense. Okay, so there's a reply. Somebody can come here and reply to me. Okay, and this is just going to be me replying to myself, but every time somebody posts, this is what the threading does. It attaches it to the parent posting, and then um, it will keep indenting as we, as we post more and more. Okay, let's just do one more there. Okay, and you can see how those thread down in a hierarchical order. All right, let's go back to modules because we have... Um, some other things to build. Okay, so that was ask a question. I'm not going to populate my getting started module right now, um, but I just want to point out the importance of having a getting started module in your class. This is where you're going to put any of that information that students need to be successful in your course. And um, like I said, we're not going to build it right now, but I am going to show you mine real quick. And what's in your getting started module um, might vary by discipline or by level of student. Higher level students like in 200 and 300 or 200 level classes are going to need less handholding than students um, like in 100 level classes. So you'll have to just judge what you think is best for your student population. But let's go back to um, my class real quick and let's go back to my modules. Okay. Let this page finish loading. Okay, so there's my getting started module. Let me show you real quick, just while we're here, this little um, 
thing you can click on here, this little triangle that will open and close content. So this is a great trick to teach students because they can close down stuff they don't want to look at and they can just open up the things that they do want to see at that time. So my getting started module has the overview and objectives for this module. And then in my learn section, I have my course orientation video. I have a page that talks about organization. I have a page that's about me. It's very similar to my profile. It gives maybe slightly different information, but is another place students can find information about me. Um, I give them, I call out some things from the syllabus that people commonly miss, like which browser is best to use with Canvas, um, how they should communicate with me. So I've clearly told them what my communication communication preferences are. Um, that's in the syllabus. It's also on this page. I give them information about technical requirements and um, they need to know how to capture a screenshot in order to um, submit their assignments. So there's little information in here on that. Um, I have a page on how to find help. I have a review activity and a couple of um, low risk type assignments and then a little quiz just to kind of reinforce everything. Your start module doesn't have to be this long. This is just what's in mine. And since we're on the topic of content, I would encourage you to reach out to eLearning Office because nine times out of 10, they are going to have a start module already built that's a template that you can import into your class and just kind of customize. So they've probably already done a lot of that work for you. For some of you, they may have even already pushed that to your classroom just to give it to you and tell you that it's there and eliminate one extra thing you had to do. Um, some e-learning offices also have templates for entire courses. So you might check in with them before you dig into doing some of this on your own and see what's already pre-built and available because that could save you some time. All right, Jen, it looks like we've got a ton of questions going there. I think um, people are just uh, posting kind of follow-up questions. Okay. Um, about, you know, just about, about things that we've already covered, like discussion okay. threads and questions. So I think you're, you're doing great. Just We're doing okay. Okay. We still have a yeah. lot to go through. And honestly, I'm willing to hang out with, here, with you all for as long as it takes. If you need to leave at the two-hour mark, leave at the two-hour mark. If you want to hang out for a little bit longer, I'll, I can stay until my voice gives out. So um, if we run a little over, it's, it's okay. Okay, so let's- um, Just one thing really quickly. Yeah. Uh, Ferguson just asked if you could share your, what browser should I use section after this presentation? Oh, sure. Actually, my class is in Canvas Commons and um, you could go and just copy the page into your course. Uh, let me see if I can find the- uh, commons. Okay, so remember at the beginning I said you could come here to find content. That's this little icon here. And you have to be logged into Canvas, I think, for it to work. And let's type in SBCTC and see what we get. Um, we've had a lot more um, activity in here. You can see there's a lot of results. The other day when I searched it, there weren't as many things. And then right here is the version of my February class. If you click on this right here, Canvas 101, you can um, preview different things. So you were specifically asking about the browser page. Okay, so here is um, a preview of what that page looks like. And um, I think, Let's see, to, to copy it, I know you go to import, um, download. I've not ever tried taking just a piece out of a full cartridge, so we might have to go find some information on that. Um, but you would need to have a destination classroom set up, which um, these are all my classrooms, so don't get overwhelmed. You won't have this many things to choose from. And then there's the import content button here. Um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe if you import content, you're, I think you're most likely going to get the entire course. I'm not sure if it stops you somewhere to ask for just a piece of it. So um, we might want to come back to that and do a little more investigation. So if you could um, remind me, I can check on that and maybe we could do like some FAQs after um, after we're done here today. But this is basically where you would find the information and it is in here. Um, 
but I could just as easily send you um, the text for the page too. So I, could you email me, Susan, please? And remind me, I don't wanna forget. Yes, thank you. And did you grab my email from earlier? I I'll can put it, it can you put it in for me, Jen, please? Thank sure, but you. I'll type it in again. All um, right. Also, Alyssa, we do have a question. Are you gonna be able to cover um, Canvas conferences today? Um, we are not gonna get to Canvas conferences. Okay, so. It's okay. in there, it's not difficult to use. Um, let me just give you a couple things about it. The one nice thing is it's built into Canvas. It is easy to use. I'm just gonna open the page real quick. Um, if you wanna build a new conference, you put it here. It's the same idea as Zoom or WebEx or Blackboard Collaborate if you've used that. It's that same interactive conferencing, web conferencing type software. Um, they're experiencing a lot of overload in conferences right now. So it is running, I think, still a little bit slowly. And the version that is in Canvas is only the basic version of conferences. So what that means is you can hold quick little things in here, but if you make a recording of it, you can only house the recording for 14 days. So do not record anything in here that you want to archive because there's no way to download and your recording's gonna get deleted after 14 days. So those are the two cautions I would give you for exploring and using conferences. But um, it is a great tool. It's easy to use. It's good if you just want students to do like quick check-ins with each other, or maybe you want to have your office hours in here and you're not archiving and you're not recording. It would be good for those kind of things. To learn about conferences, you can come to the Canvas guides, um, find the teacher guide, and there will be a whole section on um, conferences. Okay, we'll go here. And um, there's a whole section devoted to conferences and it will have all the help and to-do sheets. And if you wanna watch a video on it, go back to the video guides. Okay, so yeah, we're not gonna dig into really using that tool, although I don't mind showing like where it is and talking about it a little bit. So, okay, let's get back into our demo class here. We've got some modules to build. Okay, so in module one, the first thing I add to my modules are headers. And the reason why I use headers is because one, it helps organize my content, and two, it helps um, mobile students. You can use the indents option for um, indenting content. Do you remember when we added the discussion and I said I wasn't gonna create an indent on that, okay? Um, if you choose to indent, that can create hierarchy, but that hierarchy is not preserved when students look at it in the Canvas student app. So in order to help my mobile students, I uh, advocate for using headers. And let's just go ahead and add a header here. Okay, so uh, we're back to the same menu. Pretty much once you know how to add one thing in Canvas, you know pretty much how to create everything. They just have different names. So I'm gonna choose text header. Last time we chose discussion. So this time is a text header. I'm gonna say what I want my text header to say. And at the beginning of all of my modules, the first thing that students see is get started. Okay, so I will save that to this module. So there's my first header, get started. Okay, the next module header that I have is, um, oops, clicked on the wrong thing there. Okay, I'm gonna click on the add button again. My next text header that um, my modules have is learn. And you can call these whatever you like, just keep it consistent. That flow and rhythm from module to module really helps students stay grounded and helps them worry less about where and how to find things so that they can concentrate on the content and what you want them to learn. Okay, so I'm going to add one called learn. And then the other one I have is my to do section. And I've seen these labeled a variety of things. Whoops, again, not typing very well. Okay, so add. Okay, so I have now added three sections. And now we're going to add some content to go into those sections. All right, so I still need to add some more stuff. I want to add a document now, so I'm coming back to the same option. I'm going to choose to add a file, and 
you can see you could grab the syllabus file that we put in earlier, so that will pre-populate. I'm actually going to go snag a different document just so you can see how this works. Okay, choose a file. This is going to let me browse my computer. I'm going to grab my Canvas 101 course map, which this is an older one. I have a better version of it. This has a bunch of questions to myself in it, but we're just going to use this as an example. Okay, I'm going to open that. Um, so it selected it here. If I had specific, a specific file structure already built in my files, I would um, choose this here because then it will put my new file into my folder, but I didn't build any of that pre-webinar, um, so we can't choose it because it's not here yet. And then I am going to choose to indent this one level so that we can start to see some hierarchy. Okay, so I'm going to add this item. All right, so this is um, a document that I'm going to put in my learn section. Okay, and now I'm going to add a page. Remember I said I was going to show you how to build a page. We're going to come back to the same options here. I'm going to choose to build a page. Oops. Okay, and this is going to need to be a new page because um, we haven't built anything yet. Okay. So I'm going to click on new page. I'm going to indent it a level. And then I'm, for the sake of now, I'm just going to call it example page. But you would give it something um, more descriptive and contextual to what was on the page. And we can go look at my finished class for that. OK, so example page is our page name. And I'm going to go ahead and add that content here. OK, and well, I don't want my example page in my to-do section, so I'm going to go ahead and move that up under um, my learn section. Oh, I just realized that I need also um, an objectives page, so let's build that. I'm going to build a new one. I'm going to call this um, overview and objectives. I do this at the beginning um, of each module. And I actually give mine a title, so mine would have my module number on it. So at this, I think we said this was module one, so we'll just call this module one overview and objectives. Because you don't want to have the same page name in each module. If you have 10 modules and they're all called overview and objectives, that's not going to work. You need to give them um, unique names. Okay, so my overview and objectives are here. Okay. I'm going to come up. I'm going to put that under my getting started section. You can see that it's starting to take some sort of form here. I want to edit this page, so I'm going to go ahead and open that page up. And um, this is the page title. By default, this is your header one. When you open up the editor on any of these areas where you can um, add content, uh, this little menu is going to pop up. This is called the rich content editor. There is also an HTML view of the editor. You don't need to go there unless you want to edit something in the HTML. It's empty right now because we haven't added anything. But let's say we wanted to add sections to this. So let's say we're going to do an overview. So we'll put that in here. Um, we'll have our objectives. Okay, so we'll have this and I spelled that wrong. Canvas doesn't actually have a spell checker, so you need to rely on the spell checker that's built into your browser. I typically use Firefox with Canvas, but um, Chrome is the other one that works great. I think Chrome is the one that um, Canvas most suggests because they keep up with all of the updates in Chrome, and then Firefox is the second one. Uh, Internet Explorer is not good to use with uh, Canvas. It's just they don't keep it as updated and Canvas doesn't keep as updated with it. I Just my experience has been um, IE does not work as well. I have had a lot of luck also though using Safari with it. So any one of those top three, but Chrome's probably the best of those. All right, um, back to our page. I need to give this page some structure and I want to show you how to build a page that will look nice, but that will also be accessible and screen reader friendly. So right now I have um, two words here. These are going to be my sections. Um, I'm also going to put some bullets in, but we'll do that in a minute. What I wouldn't want to do is start making just text size changes. Like I wouldn't want to just change this to 18 and then make it bold because that doesn't tell a screen reader anything. 
So I'm going to take that um, formatting out. I'm just going to use the clear formatting button. Okay, you could have also have used um, is it control Z that I think goes backwards on pages. That's a pretty cool, good tool for undoing. Um, so now I'm back to where we started. You can see right now that this is marked as paragraph text. Okay, and do you remember earlier I told you the page name was the header one? That's the top of the hierarchy. I want these sections to be header two. So I'm going to highlight overview. I'm going to come over to this um, selection menu and I'm going to select header two and it's going to do some automatic formatting for me. So I would encourage you to use the tools that are in here. Um, this will help give the page, uh, it's called semantic structure, and it does help students using um, assistive technology to be able to navigate the page easier and in a more logical order. And the other thing it does for you is it prevents you from having to fuss around with formatting. That was so easy. That you know, just changed the, the size of that for me in one step. It also did something functional and made it more accessible. And um, that doesn't mean that you couldn't still highlight it or change the color if you wanted. But if you're going to do only one thing to formatting, use these um, style options over here. Okay. And you need to go in order. So if I had something that was a subcategory of overview, I don't know what it would be, but if we had a subcategory here, we would not, um, if this is truly a subcategory of overview, we would want to mark that one as a header three so that uh, Canvas would understand that this is, this is the main header two section, this is a main header section, and then this is a subcategory. I'm going to go ahead and take that out for now. And what I want to show you is how to do bullets. I'm just going to put some nonsensical stuff in here for now. Um, and actually, this might actually be paragraph text probably is what this is. So just paragraph, 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 paragraph. Okay, let me just put this up in here. And we'll pull that up in here. Okay, so that's all paragraph text. It's already marked as paragraph text. That's just my little introduction to the unit. You could also put an awesome video recording of yourself in here introducing it. It doesn't have to be all text-based. Uh, you could record right in here. There is a recording option where you can record and upload media right to the page. I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, I am going to come down to the objective section because those typically would be uh, bulleted. So let me give you um, a little section here. What you want to avoid is using your space bar to add indents or spacing. Okay, so we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to put spaces and dashes in here. We're not going to do anything manual like that. We are going to highlight this entire list. Oops, and I can see I have one extra space there. Okay, we're going to highlight this entire list and we're going to click on the bullet list option and we're going to make that a bulleted list. And so now we have a page that's accessible and uh, Canvas will tell the screen reader that this is a bulleted list. If we wanted this to be an ordered list rather than just an unordered bu bulleted list, we would click on the numbers here. So you can have a list one, two, three, four, whatever you need, or you can do them bulleted. If you want indents, there's an indenting tool here. You can see the bullets change the further you indent. Okay. You can add indents. We could indent everything if we wanted to leave some white margin space on the sides. Okay, there's options for, let's say you wanted that centered. Okay, you can, there's just use the tools that are in here. Um, here's where you can um, find images. I also find images from the image section of my file manager. You can see I don't have anything uploaded here yet, but let's just go grab a random image so you can see how this process works. I need to go choose a file. And let me get into my files here. You can see my messy files. I'm not very good at staying organized in my files, so hopefully I can find something quick. Um, let's just take this car. It doesn't really have any meaning to what we're doing. You would all, always want to choose an image that was meaningful and just not random to the page that you were putting it on. Um, okay, and then it's asking me for alternative text. That was a silver car. Um, you know, depending on the image you choose, you need to write something contextual for it. So um, I'm just going to write four-door sedan 
um, maybe I'll give the color silver four-door sedan. Um, this may or may not make sense um, for just what we're doing. It doesn't make any sense for what we're doing now because we're just building a test page. If this was actually something that was meaningful in the class, I'd want to give it contextualized description. If it was just decorative, I would mark this checkbox instead to mark it decorative. And then I'm going to click on upload and it's going to add that image to the page for me. And then maybe I don't want it quite that big so I can drag and drop. Maybe I want it centered. So if you can use Word, you can do this. This is super, super easy. Okay. And I was wrong. It's not four door, it's two door. So we would want to go change that. If I select the image to highlight it, I can um, go here. I can read the alt text. I'm going to change that to two door. I could change the size here. Let's say we want to make it smaller. Canvas will take care of that piece for me. I'll update that here. Okay, you can see that the size of that changed. If I wanted to link it somewhere in my class the way my homepage is linked, I would um, select the image. Then I would go to links and Canvas will tell you different places in Canvas that you can link to. If this was my homepage and I wanted to link it to a specific module, I could come here and click this and then it would make a link to that module. Um, but we're not on our homepage, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that now. Okay, so let me save this page. Okay, and so this is really messy. This is what, you know, just playing around looks like. Let's go into my classroom. I got to find my classroom. I've got too many tabs open. Let's look at one of my overview and objectives pages. Okay, so this is what mine looks like. I have my header in. I have my little introduction to this is what this module is going to be about. This is the information that's in here. And here's my objectives. And here's my bulleted list to say these are the things that students are going to learn in this particular module. And then this next button is how students navigate. You only get the next button if you have your information organized in modules. Otherwise, students don't have that option. There's my orientation video. Okay, and then students can just keep going through the module page by page. All right, let's look at my module structure real quick while I'm here. And um, I built the one in the test class with the same headers that I normally have in mind. So you can look at any module. They're all the same. I have a get started. I have a learn and I have a to do. Get started is that starting objectives and um, overview information. The learn section is the content. This would be any reading pages I've built, um, anything like that. And then the to do section is going to be the assignments and quizzes and things. Let me um, open just a page for you so you can kind of see what that looks like. I've even um, tried to keep my page layout consistent on as many things as possible. I do have a few that are different because I didn't have supporting resources to go along with them. Um, but here's one that's set up like one of my normal pages. Here's my header one. Here's my header two. Um, this is the like the introduction to the page and what they're going to learn about here. Then it's divided down into here are the resources. You can go watch the videos. This is the ad additional reading. Whatever you need students to have, you can go ahead and put it in on your pages. Okay. Um, it's this is, yeah. Three or four and people are starting to just say that they have to go. Yep, that's fine. Um, just one quick question from Cheryl before she pops off. I know this is going to be recorded, but yes. how will she access it? Can you remind us how you're going to send out the recording? Um, I actually don't know exactly where it's going to end up being housed. Okay. The information will go out the same way the invitation went out. So if you received like a forwarded email from me through your e-learning office to all campus email, that is going to go um, to you in the same way. I will send the link to all of our e-learning offices and then they typically forward that information onto the campuses. We are working right now on building a, a new page in our e-learning web pages where we can house all of the recordings so everything's in a single consistent space but we do not have that built yet. 
And actually, now this is making me just remember too that, um, you know, the Student Success Center is also going to have a one-stop shop for faculty and for staff. So Cheryl, we will definitely, but what Alyssa said, we'll definitely just be in touch the same way we were in before <laughs> to let you know how to find this recording. Yeah, and if the recording doesn't make its way to you, um, please feel free to email me. What I've done with my email is I'm, I, I'm getting so many emails right now and trying to answer questions that I've set my out of office with a reply that gives resources. I'm not out of the office. I just have put in information that answers a lot of the questions I'm fielding right now. So you might get an auto reply. And if I can link to something like the recording there or tell you where it is from there, um, that would be be a good way for you to, to be able to come back and access that also. I know um, some people need to leave. Um, I really do want to make this a complete recording, so I'll keep going whether there are people here or not. If you can hang out and want to stay, please feel free to do so. If not, please feel free to um, log out and thank you for joining us. Um, we are a little bit after three. I do still want to show how to build an assignment and how to put a quiz in and how to find the speed grader. And um, then if anybody's still here that wants to talk about importing or copying content, we can get to some of those other things too. Okay, Jen, am I good to keep going then? Yes, and I'm so sorry. I have to run because I have another meeting okay. as well. So I'm so sorry. Okay. So Ty, can you, Ty, do you mind? Uh, be, uh, well, Ty's doing a great job. Yes, yeah, um, Ty's working in the... Um, <laughs> in the chat. That's fine. Um, just doing Ty doesn't job. have a mic, so I'll just kind of take over watching the chat as best I can. And um, she, uh, Ty can ping me in the in the chat if she needs me to to look at something specific. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right, Jen. Thank you so much for being here. Much appreciated. Great job, thank Alyssa. You. Great job, oh. everyone. Stay strong. Yep. <laughs> You're not in this alone. We are here to course. help you. <laughs> All right. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, so um, let me just close a few things here. And um, okay, so we are back to our practice area here. Um, let's just add an assignment real quick. Okay, we're gonna go here. We're going to build an assignment. I don't, I do have one example assignment built, so I could either choose from that, that's the one we put on the calendar earlier, or I could choose to build a new assignment. Um, Let's just for ease, let's go ahead and choose the one that's already here. I want an indent of one level. I'm gonna go ahead and add that. Okay, and that is in my to-do section. I'm gonna open the editor on this. And I'm just opening this in a separate tab so that we can go back and forth between things. I am going to open the editor. And it's too bad that, Jess, uh, that Jen just left because I was just getting to the part that um, she was gonna be really passionate about. And that was um, when you're putting the directions in for your students, give them a purpose, a task, and their criteria for success. And you can choose what that looks like for your class. Um, I'm gonna make these headers again because um, this will save you time later. It makes it more usable by a wider audience. You won't have to go back and change it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and build this into my page. The purpose is going to be like the objective. Why are we completing this assignment? Okay, I'm not gonna take the time to actually write that out. The task might be the directions, what students are supposed to do. Okay, maybe that comes in the form of a bulleted list. Maybe it's a handout with directions that they download. Um, you decide what it looks like for your class. Okay, criteria for success. This could also be a list of things that they can um, compare their finished work. Whoops, I got my caps lock on there. They could um, maybe compare their finished work to student work that you've provided or a worked example that you've provided them. Um, could be a rubric that you include. Um, could be a link to like an example project. There's lots of different things that could go here. And then to this, I typically add um, like help resources. And you saw that on some of my pages. I'm gonna go ahead and make that a header. Okay. And then I'm gonna go ahead and list out any technology help pieces that students need here to use to make it all handy. So, um, 
purpose, task, criteria, make sure to be transparent about what you want students to do, how you want them to do it, state it clearly, give good explanation, give examples for them to look at, use a rubric. Um, I'll show you how to do a rubric here in a second. Let's do points on this one. Let's say this is worth 20 points. Okay, I'm not going to choose um, a different assignment group because this is an assignment. I could build a new group here if I wanted. Okay, but I'm just going to say that this is assignments. How do we want to display this? Do we want to display it as points? Do we want to display it as a percentage? Letter grade? You can choose. I'm just going to use points because it's what I'm most familiar with and it's what I use in my class. If you didn't want it to count toward the final grade, you can check this button. Here you're going to decide what type of submission you want the students to make. I want my students to make an online submission. Most of you are going to be choosing this too because um, you're not going to be getting paper submissions anymore. I've never used the external tool, but my guess is, is this is a submission that comes in through some sort of other um, tool that you're using in your class. And maybe Ty, if you're familiar with that external tool piece, maybe you could type a little bit um, about that into the chat as further explanation on that while I finish talking about these other things. So I chose an online submission and then I get to choose how I want my students to submit. Do I want them to make a text entry? Do I want them to submit a website URL? Do I want media recordings? Do I want file uploads? Most commonly it's going to be file uploads. Um, but it is okay to go ahead and check all of the boxes if you want to give your students a lot of freedom in what they send you and how they send it. I would suggest being flexible right now um, with the way you accept files because not everybody's going to have access to Word. Some students might need to submit a URL to a Google Doc if they don't have Word on their home computer. So um, try to think ahead and be as accommodating up front as possible. If you do need to restrict a file type, you can do that here. On and all you need to do is um, type in the file extension of um, what you want to restrict and you can add as many of those in there as you want. I'm not going to put a restriction on mine so I'm going to uncheck that one. This is not a group assignment so I'm not going to check the group assignment. I'm not going to do a peer review on this. I am assigning it to everyone. If you're not assigning it to everyone, I think when you have groups populated and some other things, sections, you can, you'll have choices. Um, if you have, I don't, we don't have any students in here, so I can't show you. I think you can also assign it to individual students. I don't, I don't use that very often, um, but I believe that that part's in there. You can choose your due date. Um, we can say that this is due on the 27th. Okay, and then this is where you can choose your available from and un available until. So this is the opening date and this is when um, the assignment locks down and you can make those choices for whatever works for your class and your teaching. I'm going to go ahead um, and say save and pub publish uh, because this is feeling um, pretty finished to me. The only thing that we haven't added is the rubric, but we can go back and add that here just one second. Let's go ahead and save this. Okay, so this is what it looks like with all that information added. Once you've saved it, you will have an option to add the rubric. Again, it's a plus button, so plus rubric means that you're going to add the rubric here. Okay, and then um, on the lower part of my screen, it popped up the options for the rubric. Um, give your rubric a name. You can put descriptions in here. You can say all of these little pencil icons are editing, so you can edit those to say whatever you want. You can put more information in there. So if we open this up, there are text boxes. You can give um, additional description if you want. You can change the title. I'm not going to change any of that now. You can also change if you wanted that to be 10 points instead of 5. You can do um, whatever you want there. I didn't actually change anything, so I'm just going to cancel it. If you need more than two boxes, you can just click this expand button and it pops open those same options. Okay, so, um, oh, it's telling me that I need a rating. I'm just going to type something random in there for now. Okay, and so see ASDFDSAF went in where no marks was at. Okay, so you can make these to be descriptive for your students. You can add as many of those as you want. Okay, that's a single line of your rubric. Oops, 
okay, I want to add more criterion. So I'm going to either duplicate the one I already have or I can do a new one if I want. So um, let's just duplicate it to, to go fast. Okay, description. Um, you can put a longer description in if you want. Okay, so now it's basically just copied exactly what we already did. You can do that as many times as you want to until you get your rubric populated. And then you have some other choices down here. Um, I'll write freeform comments when assessing um, means that you're going to dig in and write exactly what it says, free form comments. Um, I personally um, choose to do my grading a little bit differently. I like to say use this rubric for assignment grading and then that allows me to access it in the speed grader and then I put all of my detailed feedback into the comments tool. Um, and we can go in and do that if you guys want to stick around long enough to do that. Okay, so this button is important because this button right here, use this rubric for assignment grading, is what's going to um, populate the score into the gradebook from the speed grader. So let me click create here. Um, okay, it looks like I have... Um, a problem with my uh, points. So I'm just going to let Canvas correct that for me. And now everything is adding up and doing what it's supposed to do. I wasn't paying enough attention when I created my rubric. So Canvas gave me a little warning and I just let Canvas fix it for me. Okay, so here's the rubric now. It's attached to the assignment. And then when I go to the speed grader and um, your teacher tools are going to be on the right hand side. So I'm going to pop into speed grader right now and show you um, what that looks like in speed grader. We don't actually have a submission, but if the student, if I'd gone into the test student uploaded a document, it would display here or the link to the document if I'd asked for a URL would be here or a video if I had asked for a media recording or um, could just be text if I'd asked for a text-based submission that would display there and then I'm going to click on view rubric and then there's that um, rubric that we just created okay and then I can go through it and I can assign points and when I click the save button it will populate those points up here and this is what goes into the gradebook view so I think when we go look at our gradebook um, Hopefully this information will save there, but there wasn't technically a submission by the student, so we'll have to see if that works or not. And then here is where I would give um, my feedback on, um, you know, you did this really great on your assignment. Here's one little piece that you might want to go back and look at, you know, your constructive um, feedback for, you know, improving their work so that they know for next time that, you know, they can, they can make changes and improve. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Ty did get a um, chat response typed in about um, the external tool option. Um, Ty says that in their area, it can take forever to download a file that just says read chapter three, submit a 200 word response. And that's where putting the information just directly into the directions in Canvas, that directions area, could save you um, and your students a lot of time if you have slow downloads. And then um, Ty goes on to say that the external tool option is most commonly tied to the publisher materials. Okay, that's what I was thinking. And that the options will depend on what your college has approved or activated. That is actually um, a very great response to that. So thank you. Um, do you instruct students to get notifications for assignment comments? Um, I'm not remembering right off the top of my head if there's a um, if there's a choice to receive comments notifications, yes, I think that would be um, a great thing for you to suggest for your students. I typically will send out um, a message with information of how to find my comments just to remind them that they need to go and um, look for those. And then I also see in the chat, um, that we have some people that need to leave and that's fine. 
Um, did you mention we could access the demo Canvas class? Okay, you're not going to have access to the class that I'm demoing. What you do have access to is the public version of Canvas 101. It looks a lot like the class that I showed you. It is a public version of my actual Canvas 101 training. But when you have a classroom set for public access, meaning people don't need to sign up or register to join it, when it's set that way, a a few of the options in the classroom are disabled and I've left a note for you here about that. So if you go into my modules, you will see all the same information that we um, saw before. I've added a few things like how you can find training registration and whatnot, but you're not going to be able to access um, discussions, assignments, and quizzes. You can click on them and see the content, but you can't actually make a submission there. And then I think if you land on a discussion, it might actually pop you out of the class. So um, I need to go in and fix those. Um, access through the Canvas guide. No, the access to this is not through the Canvas guide. It is in that document that I showed you earlier. Um, that course design document I shared. Where did it go? This one. So um, you can get access to it here if you go up to the Canvas section of this document, and we'll scroll back up to the top for this. Uh, one more section, one more. Okay, I've got to get all the way to the top here. Okay, so Canvas 101 Public, this is where you're going to be able to access um, my classroom to be able to preview um, like the different pages. It's kind of, it's, it's curated the same way that my Canvas 101 training is. So if you want to look at resources and read some additional comment that's on my pages, that's a good place to go and do that. And that link is for you in that course design doc that we shared out earlier. All right, um, I'm going to go back into um, the demo classroom because I do want to show one other really um, cool thing that can help you um, get going. I haven't built a quiz yet, and I've specifically done that for a reason, and I'll tell you what that reason is here in just a second. Um, you do need to publish stuff for um, it to be viewable to your students. You can see I clicked the one button to publish the module. It published everything in my module for me. And um, I'm gonna delete this one thing because this is not something I would necessarily want in each module. So let me just delete that. Okay. And then what I wanna show you how to do is how to duplicate a module. And if you come over to this um, stacked menu over here, should pop up. Oops, it's not working for me. Let's see. We get a pop-up menu and um, there is a duplicate feature in here. So you can duplicate a module. So this is a fast way to build a template. Like you might just want to come in and put all of your headers in and then you could duplicate it. But see that just made a quick copy. You can also copy things in a module. Um, let's say if I wanted to copy this page, I can duplicate just a page. Um, I'm going to choose duplicate there, and then it'll make a copy of that page for me. So there are some little workflow things in here that can make stuff easier for you. The fastest, easiest way to get your modules um, and your structure is to check with your e-learning office and see if they have a template built um, already that you can that you can go ahead and use. Okay, um, and I, the reason why I didn't build a quiz yet is because I wanted to show the uh, duplicate module feature first. And if you have a quiz in your module, this is something I learned during the last demo that I actually didn't know, is that you can't duplicate a module when there's a quiz in it. So let me just go ahead and show how to build that quiz real quick. And we're gonna just copy that same, same process that we've been doing. We're just gonna choose quiz instead of an assignment or a discussion. Okay, this is gonna be a new quiz for us. Uh, keeping with what we've been doing, I'm just gonna call this example quiz for now. Okay, you'll give your quiz real contextualized um, information for the names. I am gonna indent it one level, okay, so that it remembered that. I'm gonna add that item. 
Okay, so now I've built the quiz shell. I don't need to move it anywhere because it's already in my to-do section. Anything new that you add to a module populates at the bottom and then you can drag and drop wherever you want it. You can even drag and drop your modules around. Um, so if I wanted to change the order of my modules, I could grab this and move it up or down. Okay, so that's how you do that. Let's open up this quiz. And I know we're way over time. Um, I'm doing this for the benefit of the recording. So if you need to go, it's totally fine. And we will get questions answered. Okay, so this is what the quiz looks like before you add anything to it. It tells you that it's unpublished. Um, you can tell that I haven't done anything to it because just the default settings are here. I'm gonna open the editor and wait for it to open. Okay, this, you've got two tabs here. One is called details and one is called questions. The details tab is for, um, this is where the quiz directions go. Okay, and I'm just gonna go ahead and make that a header. Okay, and then I'm gonna list out here anything students need to know about taking this quiz or any information I want them to have. Then I'm going to go down further on the page and I'm going to say, okay, this is going to be a graded quiz. Yes, but I could choose practice quiz, survey, or ungraded survey. I'm going to keep it a graded quiz. This is where I could choose my assignment group. We haven't actually gotten into talking about assignment groups yet. I didn't build an assignment group specifically for quizzes, so we, we're just going to leave it here in assignments for now. And then you're going to choose some options. If you want the answers to shuffle and be different each time the student takes the quiz, you can shuffle that here. If you want to add a time limit, you can do that here. Um, let's say this is a one hour quiz, so we would need to choose 60 minutes. If I want students to be able to take this multiple times, I'm going to check the I want them to take it multiple times button. This allows them to practice a few times. And then I'm going to mark this as to keeping the highest score. And if I don't want them to have unlimited attempts, and there are times when you would just leave something open unlimited because it was practice, but if I did want to lock it down, I would tell them that they can take this quiz five times and Canvas is going to retain their highest score. And the student doesn't need to do anything other than take the quiz. You don't need to do anything other than have your students take the quiz because Canvas is going to store that data for that student. All right, then I'm going to decide how I want students to see their quiz responses. Um, maybe only after their last attempt. Well, I don't think that's particularly helpful. Maybe I just want my students to see the correct answers or some sort of prompt after they've taken it so they kind of know where they need to go and concentrate before they take the quiz again. So you can choose what works best for you. You can choose a specific day, date, and time. You can hide stuff. Um, I'm not gonna mess with any of those right now. If you want your quiz to show one question at a time, this is the box that you want. I like to use show one question at a time if the quiz is particularly long. And I will cite me being very visual and getting easily overwhelmed by a lot of text. So I prefer if it's a really long, like if it was 50 really long questions I had to answer, my preference would be to see them one at a time. If it was a short five question quiz, I don't care if I look at those all together. Um, but you choose what you think um, works best for you. Um, I do see a comment in here. I thought shuffle answers made the answers in different order from student to student, making it hard to cheat. Um, basically what it means is every time the student takes the quiz, they get a different order. So um, just when they log in, Canva, Canvas um, shuffles those around. So yeah, it does make it more difficult for them to cheat, but they're not going to be sitting right next to each other cheating either. So, and I would encourage you to write test questions that aren't as cheatable. So um, we're not going to get into like assessment styles or any, we're not going to have a chance to get into to that today. Um, but um, do practice um, writing effective quiz questions. Just um, that makes it 
harder for students to come up with like go and look for answers or compare answers. All right, um, moving on. I also don't lock my questions after answering. Um, again, this is a personal preference for me. If I don't readily know the answer to something, it sometimes gives me anxiety and I might want to skip that and think on it. And if my teacher has locked those down, I can't come back to that question. I would have to skip it if I wasn't thinking or I might just sit there and be really tense and anxious about, oh my gosh, I don't know the answer to this question. And I might sit there so long that um, I forget that I have, you know, 10 other questions I need to go and answer and I might run out of time. So that's just a personal preference for me. I try to be as flexible as possible. Um, so I don't lock those down, but there are certain situations and in certain industries, like if you're taking a test for um, a specific, you know, certification or something, maybe that's a requirement that you don't get to go back to questions. And if it is, there's a feature in here for you to use to address that. Um, you can um, restrict your quizzes with an access code and filtering IP addresses. I've not ever used any of those. I'm sure Ty probably has run into um, that, but I have not. And then um, here, just like with our assignment and with our graded discussion, we can choose who we want to assign it to, when the due date. Uh, we'll pick next Friday again, just because that's easy. And um, again, your open and end dates. I'm not gonna take the time to put anything in there. And, okay, let's, I think we're done with that. So now I'm gonna go from the quiz details tab, I'm gonna go over to the questions tab, and this is where you're actually going to build a question. Some of you may be importing questions from um, different publishers and things please go see your e-learning office for some help with that because every publisher stuff imports a little bit differently. But what I'd like to show you now is just how to build a simple question. Um, Ty did type in the chat, no, it randomizes for every access. You can create a question bank for a quiz with 50 questions, but when you build the question, um, you will have to pull, say, 15 randomly from the bank of 50. Then pretty much every quiz would be different. That is an excellent explanation of that, Ty. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to um, go ahead and um, just build a simple question here. And again, add question, and then um, you choose what you want the question type to be. I'm gonna choose multiple choice. And then this is where the quiz question goes. Okay, so you're gonna type your quiz question there. And then you're gonna come down and type your answer responses, okay? And you can see that Canvas is saying that the correct answer is this one. And that's just kind of the default that the correct answer is displayed at the top to save you time. But if you happen to type it out of order, you can um, just change where that arrow points. And this doesn't have um, anything to do with how the quiz answers are gonna be displayed to students. That doesn't mean that the correct answer is always gonna be in the first spot. That's just a, an efficiency thing for teachers to have the correct answer at the top. Okay, the other thing that you wanna probably put into a quiz is some sort of feedback. You could say, um, try again if they've gotten the question wrong. Um, you could direct them, you know, please go see um, module two for a review of this concept, whatever it's important for you to put in there um, for students. Um, so that was for the wrong answer. You can add it to each individual answer response and you could just say something simple or you could direct them to other resources. Hey, you've mastered this, you know, go look at this other extra concept or something. So um, this is a really great opportunity for additional teaching. And um, then I'm just gonna update my question here and save it. Okay, and this is what the question looks like in the question tab. If I had like say 10 of these and I wanted to quickly look through all of them in the answer responses, I have this little um, checkbox up here for show question details and that's gonna pop open all of the details and it would do that for every question that I had displayed here. When this question is ready to be, or when this quiz is ready to be used, when you're finished 
adding all of your questions to it and you're ready to publish it for students, you can click save and publish. If you're not done with it and you don't want students to have access to it, you can just save it as a draft and come back to it later. I'm going to go ahead and say save and publish. Okay, and then so now it's saved. You can use the preview button to um, go in and preview this quiz if you'd like to see what it would look like. You could also pop back to student view like we were in way earlier in um, our time together and uh, look at it and take the quiz as a student. Make sure everything is operating the way that you want it. Uh, Canvas now has a list of all of those settings and it will display this to students. So all of that information where we changed settings is here. If you need to moderate a quiz, you can use this feature here. And I actually haven't done this for a long time. We do have a test student in here, so that did populate. And then um, if you need to do something different for a specific student, um, you can just edit. And if you need to give this student, um, say they need seven attempts instead of five, and maybe they get time and a half, so 60 minutes, half of that's 30, so you would change their time limit to 90 and then save. And then this changes that information just for that particular student and they're the only ones that can see that change. All right. Oops, my bad on that. I'm sorry, I accidentally muted my um, my mic, my bad. Um, let's see, um, Ty, could you type in the chat real quick what the last thing that you heard was? Because I'm not sure how long that was been muted. I accidentally leaned on it and didn't realize. Oh, you don't remember where I was when the, okay, that's okay. Okay, so what I was saying, I was answering, um, I had gone through the moderate quiz. Uh, could you all just give me a, a heads up that, um, just give me a yes that, that you heard that part about moderating the quiz for the individual student, for the test student? Yeah, you got that part. Okay, then I went back into the chat and I read a question from Holly uh, regarding um, like Canvas getting overloaded because everybody's moving into Canvas right now. And so I was just saying that um, we had talked with our customer uh, service managers at Instructure um, earlier in the week and they've assured us that they're doing everything they possibly can to redistribute um, the server loads and to make sure that everything's up and running. I have to tell you, Canvas has the best track record of any learning management I've ever seen for, for their uptime. I mean, they're up in like 99 plus something percent, I think still. So um, while it is kind of a concern, probably in the back of some people's minds, I feel confident that they're going to be able to handle it. They've always been responsive to needs in the past, and um, I think they'll do whatever they can do to make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay, uh, Rick is just confirming in the chat that I mentioned 90 minutes and, and 12 attempts. So um, yeah, okay, so you guys, you got all that information. All right, um, let's see if there's any other questions. Yep, we were adding extra time, okay. I think we've kind of been keeping up on questions as we've um, gone through. Okay, so let me check my list and see um, what other things we need to look at. 
Okay, we did modules. I talked about accept, accessible pages. Um, I showed you using the um, content editor, the rich content editor tools. I didn't show you the accessibility checker. Um, and I did do an image, we did do links. I didn't show you how to do a video. We didn't get there. We did build a discussion. Um, we did an assignment. We did a simple rubric and a quiz. And we've been in the speed grader. Okay, so uh, let me just hit a few other highlights here. Um, grades is where you're gonna find your grade book. And hopefully our um, test student information is here, and it is. We have um, our example assignment, and then we do have, um, looks like something unpublished in here too. That's the copy that we made. So as a teacher, we would know that we needed to go and make that published so students would be able to see it. Here's our example quiz. Student hasn't taken it yet so that there isn't a score in there, but do you remember when we were in the speed grader and we graded something and it was 10 points? So we've got that student's information here. If we wanted to see information about that submission, we can come over here. We could jump right to the speed grader. We can mark it as late or missing. There's a variety of things uh, that you can do in here. I'm just going to close that down and show you just a few other things. Um, this is the newer version of the gradebook. I am on um, the, I'm not in individual view right now, um, so I'm just in the default view of the gradebook, and um, you can change how things are ordered. I'm not gonna talk about all of these because, um, I mean, we're getting really deep into some of this, but there are lots of things in here. If you need to add a notes column, um, this is asking to show unpublished assignments. So that's a new feature. I actually just learned that just now while we were talking. Okay, some actions. Um, maybe at the end of your class, you wanna export your gradebook or maybe you have something you want to import, those options are here. And then you do have some other things um, in the gradebook. I'm not sure if the person who asked earlier about the posting policies is still here or not, but this is what that question was referring to. There's a late policy you can set. There is a grade posting policy. I have mine set to automatically post grades because I don't need to hide anything, um, but that's just my preference. There are cases where um, manually releasing grades to students makes sense for teachers. Um, Ty, could you um, maybe confirm in the chat for me because I don't work on the, I don't work with like quarterly grading as much. Um, and because I just always have mine set to automatic. Do you know about the manual post um, policy that has to be set before you start grading assignments? Is that correct? Do you know? I don't want to say anything that is um, misleading or incorrect. So, okay. So Ty just confirmed that for me. If you want to use manually um, showing your grades to students where you would go in and release the grades when you're ready you do have to set this button before you have graded anything because it does not hide things um, that you have already graded and then you come in here and check this button it doesn't it doesn't hide the things that you um, had already had in there as grades okay uh, Ty also says correct if the grading policy is not set ahead of time then the hide post grades gets really messed up yeah and that's where I didn't want to misspeak and um, give out misinformation so thank you for confirming that for me um, I do just leave mine set to automatic if you need more information about the posting policies go back to the canvas guides look it up and you can find your answers there and then um, I have an advanced tab in mine I don't know if all of the colleges have this option enabled but I can over ride um, final grades from there. If I have extra points and different things I need to add in, you can do that here if your college has that feature enabled. Okay, so um, we went to the gradebook. Okay, I want to hit the files area real quick. Like I said, we can't get super in-depth on everything, but we can get you, um, you know, a high-level understanding of stuff. And Ty, I know we were only supposed to go till three, so if you're busy and need to, to go, um, please feel free. That's fine, I can manage the rest on my own. 
Okay, so um, this is the file manager that I've been talking about as we were going through where I said if you had your file structure set up ahead of time, you could choose those files. Um, they would pre-populate when you were adding things. So um, I'm just going to create um, a folder here. And for now, I'm just going to call this example folder because I'm not feeling particularly creative about what to call things. Okay, so now I have an example folder. Um, maybe you have one called images and maybe you would put all of your images in a folder. I mean, you have to decide how is best gonna, you know, organize you. Whoops, I wanna do that, okay. Okay, so there's another folder and now I'm just gonna grab my car picture that we uploaded earlier and I'm gonna put that in images just to keep myself organized. And um, maybe my example folder is gonna be for documents or maybe assignment examples. So I'm just gonna go ahead and drag those over there and then you can kind of start to see how it cleans it up and helps you stay organized. You've got these little expanders here. And when you've got lots of files in there, it will show them. Um, I just went ahead and clicked on images. You can see the car that I moved. Okay, here are the example um, documents we had from earlier. And then this little indicator right here, these little green, uh, it says accessibility score. That means that my document is accessible. And um, I did that by working in Word and using the styling in Word, all of the built-in styling features in Word to create an accessible document because you can add headers in Word and styling the same way I showed you how to do the pages um, in the rich content editor here in Canvas. So that's good that that shows that that is accessible. If it wasn't fully accept accessible, my gauge would, um, be not all the way to the right. It might be like yellow saying, yeah, you did a great job to this point, but here's a few um, tips that might help you. And um, on my image, it also says that it's accessible and that's accessible because we took the time to add the alternative text. So um, that looks good. Um, one thing I would note on um, accessibility is, and I don't think I have it in the, um, I, don't, I think I took it out of navigation, but let me just go grab it because the accessibility checker is something I wanted to show you. Um, let me find, okay, I'm gonna show you two things. Okay, so this is the accessibility report. This is Ally. Okay, so I drug that up to our menu so we can see it. Now I need to save my page. Okay. Okay, so now that should be an option in my menu. Okay, I'm not going to get super detailed on it. Uh, I just want to show you um, what this does. A lot of the colleges are using this. I think the majority of them are, if they have it enabled, you can click this button and it will tell you how accessible your course is and it will tell you things that you might want to go back and fix. Now, it's going to be hard to get a 97% score on a regular class uh, because you have a lot of stuff in there, but you should aim to have this as high as possible. Ours is showing really, really high for this because we don't have very much content in here and the stuff that I did over upload um, was pretty accessible to begin with. It's identifying that I have um, an issue that I could fix. So um, let me just click on this real quick and see what it is. And it says that this um, document has tables that don't have any headers. So I would wanna go back into um, my document and fix that. So it will help you um, with these things. And if like say we didn't take the time to put alt text in on our image when we first added it, you know, that descriptive text that we added, it would give us a prompt to say, hey, come back in here and give some description for this image so um, that everybody knows what that image is for. There is also a built-in accessibility checker in Canvas. The one I just showed you is Ally and it is an additional tool. It's called an LTI and it's been integrated into Canvas. So um, it's been added in. It's not a part of Canvas, it's an add-in. Um, but Canvas does have its own built-in checker. And let me just show you where you can find that. Would have been a lot more meaningful probably if I'd opened a page that had content on it, but that's all right. 
Okay, so we're going to look at the rich content editor again. And this rich content editor you've seen in lots of places. It's been in announcements, quizzes, discussions, assignments, pages. So um, this tool will be available anywhere you open up the editor and have access to the, the rich content toolbar. So the accessibility uh, checker in Canvas is here. It's um, this little person inside a circle. And um, I clicked on it. It says no accessibility errors were detected. Well, that's a little misleading for this page because I don't have any content on it. So technically it's accessible, but technically it's also empty. But that tool is there for you if you um, want to, to, you know, be coming in to try to identify areas that could be problematic. But again, if you're building with those headers that I showed you on the styling men menu, if you're building with those from the beginning, you're going to get a, loss, a lot less accessibility er um, errors than you would if you just um, like copy and paste text in here and then don't do any formatting work on it. All right. Let's see. Um, oh, I didn't show you how to upload a file. I showed you how to um, I, I did show you where the files were and I showed you how to make a folder, but I did neglect to show you how to upload. If you want to upload something here, um, you're just going to click this upload and then you search your computer and upload uh, whatever you want. I'm not going to take the time to do it, but that's the process that you would go through and then it would add it here. If you um, click on the folder that you want it in, um, it will, I think, I think it adds it directly to the folder if you have that folder open. So that's another way to stay organized here. All right, um, I think the final thing that I would want to show you is to go back to the home page. And um, now you can see that there's content. You remember when we first landed on this page, there was absolutely nothing here because we hadn't built any modules yet. I'm just going to make sure everything's published first. And you remember that this um, this was set to be the modules view of the home page. Okay, so that's what we're seeing right now. Okay, um, but one of the final things you need to do before your students can see and interact with your class, and this is something I forgot to mention last week, is to hit this publish button. And I'm going to publish my course and that means that this is now going to be um, viewable to the participants in the class. So anybody that's registered into the class can now view this content. But the content stays unpublished in a draft state until you change it. So you leave it unpublished until you're ready for people to be in there and the quarter starts and you're ready to have students viewing stuff. Um, Save your e-learning offices some time by remembering to publish your classes uh, because they do get calls from students of I can't see my course. It will give students an error that says that their course isn't available and then they kind of get panicky. So um, make sure that you do come in here and um, publish that when the quarter is started when you're ready to have your students in there. And then the other thing you need to publish are the individual items that are in your um, modules and your different content areas here. Okay, so um, I have gone through the majority of my list. I think I probably could um, talk about stuff all day. Uh, things we didn't get to were audio and video recording, although I do think I slightly mentioned that, but we didn't open it. That tool's in the content editor. And then I did show you how to add links and images, but I did not show you how to add a video. So um, if you'd like to see that, we could um, just wrap up with that and then do some questions if anybody has some. Ty, is there anything else you can think of that is um, important? I didn't get super deep into like the assignments or the grading schemes or anything like that. I'll give Ty just a second to type in the chat and see if there's anything um, that we might have missed. Um, while Ty's doing that, I'm going to open up our example page. Okay, and let me open up the editor. And I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to grab a video real quick. So we got a little disorganized and out of out of order here just a little bit, but um, this is good to know how to add a video to a page. 
Okay, Ty's, um, Ty's note was that um, I've covered a good bit of info. I, I do think we've gone over quite a bit. Um, do be careful when you're selecting um, videos from um, YouTube that you're um, trying to use um, open resources. I am just going to snag, um, I'm going to look and see if I can find the one I usually use for demos. My Blackberry is not working. This one I don't think is open source, but it is really funny. So if you've never seen this one, um, <laughs> it's, it's a really funny one to watch. So I'm just going to um, open the information on this. There's two, a there's a couple different ways. I'm going to I'm going to pause this if it's let me. Okay. So that's paused. Wait for the page to load. Uh, you can go to share and you can copy this URL. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that. Uh, I need to find our page. Let's see, I got way too many things open still here. Oh, there's our example page. Okay, so I'm gonna copy and paste this link in. So there's just a basic link. You can see that it added that, but that's not really great looking because that's what the student's gonna see is that just URL. So I'm going to say my Blackberry isn't working. Okay. And then I'm going to use that technique I showed you earlier of adding a contextualized descriptive link. Okay. And so now what the student will see is actually a description of what the name of that video is. And then um, that's a way to link a video to a page. Let's go ahead and save that so you can see what it looks like. And then I'll show you one other method. So the first time I put it in, I didn't put the descriptive text with it. That's not going to be meaningful to anybody. So we want to make sure that we give um, that information um, that this is my BlackBerry isn't working so that people can see what that is and what they're clicking on. Okay, let me open this up one more time. And I'm going to show you one other method for getting videos in here. I'll just add it here in the middle. Um, okay, back in our share area, if they have it set to embed, you can come and grab embed code. And that's what this iframe information is here. And I'm going to grab that and I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to go back to our Canvas page if I can find it. Okay. And then, um, Rather than typing that code here, because if I paste this code in, it's going to be code and we don't, that's not what we want students to see. So I'm going to open the HTML version of the editor and this is the coding for the text that's actually on the page. And I'm going to come down and I'm actually going to pop the iframe information down here and go back to the editor and then it will have popped in a preview of that. So let me save the page so you can see what that looks like. And the reason why I went ahead and left the iframe information here is so you could see what it would look like if you, oops, <laughs> accidentally clicked on the wrong thing there. Let's see, hold on. Okay, so I left it in here for you so you could see what that looked like. Um, in case you had made a mistake, you'd be like, oh, gosh, that's not what that was supposed to look like. It's supposed to look at like this. Then you know that you forgot to open, open the um, HTML editor and add that information in. Okay, so that was the last, very last thing on my list was um, adding videos. I think the only place we didn't hit maybe was assignments. We did talk about how to uh, create an assignment. These are the assignments that we built and copied as we were working through. Uh, so those are here. If I wanted to add another group to the assignments, I could add, like if I wanted this to be discussions, I could add one for discussions. If I wanted to add one for quizzes, I could add one for quizzes. Okay, and then we have a quiz here, so we could just easily drag and drop that down in here. And then let's open this up and see, not remembering, let's see, I think, let's see, edit. Okay, and this is where we can tell um, Canvas if we want, um, 
it to ignore a certain number of submissions. So um, lowest scores, highest scores, never drop anything. You have options in this back piece here where you can choose what this assignment group's gonna do. Maybe you want to have 10 quizzes, but you only want to keep the scores on nine of them. Those are the settings that you're gonna have um, back in here. And then um, if I want to assign assignment weights, I'm going to go up to this other little menu up here, click on assignment group weights. And if I want to weight the final grade based on my assignment groups, I'm going to grab this and then I'm going to say assignments are worth 30%. Um, discussions are worth 30%. And then um, what do we have left? Uh, 30 40 percent okay sorry I don't I don't do math well either I don't type and I don't do math okay but now I've added percentages that was real easy and now canvas is going to calculate that for you into the students grade so that's real easy to do okay I really um, <laughs> I really just keep talking and I just kind of kept going for the sake of the recording because I did want it to be really complete um, let's go back in and just see if there's any other questions and um, if you have a question, please ask it now. Okay, um, question about having your email addresses to email the recording. Um, no, because it's going to go out through the e-learning offices, but if you want to, I need to send it out for captioning first. Um, if you want to email me, um, maybe early next week or midweek next week, if you haven't seen the recording go out through your e-learning office and you need a copy of that, um, please um, go ahead and um, email me and I'll make sure that you get a copy. Uh, Rick is asking a question, is there a way to calculate the final grade from the percentage using a formula? What type of formula are you thinking? I'm, I'm thinking maybe the answer to your question is probably no. Um, I, I have my grade book set up like this. Okay, uh, GPA. Okay, so Canvas, I don't think does that. I've never put anything like that in there, although I do have a grading scheme set up in mine. Um, Ty, you can type comments on um, this question too if you have a response. Um, oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. In addition to um, what I'm gonna show or something different maybe. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go to my course settings and I'm gonna go to the details tab and I'm gonna go down to, let me see if I can find where it's at. Um, Okay, enable course grading scheme, I do that. And then if you wanna set your grading scheme, I have a grading scheme set up for ABC, but you could totally set this up with what you're talking about with um, figuring a grade point. But I don't think this is necessarily what you were asking. This to me, the GPA equals 0 0.08 um, P. Um, 3.6. I'm thinking that that is something that you use in Excel and I'm not aware of anywhere in Canvas where you can enter a formula like that. Um, but there is this grading scheme piece in here. If your school has a grading scheme set up for you that's in here, you can select that. I don't have anything different in here so it's not showing any options but that's where it would be. Um, just going to cancel that. Um, one thing that you could do though, Rick, if you wanted is um, maybe not set, if you don't set any of the um, assignment group weights like we were showing just a second ago, I think what you might want to do to do yours is come to your gradebook and um, export a CSV file and make it into um, an Excel sheet and then you could enter your calculation and do your grading as normal and then you would just need to um, enter that wherever you're asked like a student briefcase or CTC link or wherever you're entering your grades you would just go ahead and enter there. So I'm not sure um, 
I, I hope that I hope that answered your question. All right, um, I think we need to call it good. We're a full hour over. Um, I really appreciate our transcriptionist sticking out with us this whole time. I'm so sorry we went um, over um, and we're gonna make this recording available to you. So thank you everybody for attending. I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording, but I'm going to exit screen share here first. Uh, thank you again to Ty and to Jennifer for uh, helping out today, and we will get this recording out to everyone. I'm stopping that now. Okay.